Hello everybody, I'm Kristen Fung, an SCAAS support staffer and video coordinator, and welcome to the 2020 Advocacy and Empowerment Training Course Program. This is a course training provided for sickle cell patients inspired by the Sickle Cell Anemia Awareness of San Francisco nonprofit. I know we are all facing a tough time right now, and I'm so glad that you have taken the time to be with us for a third course of 2020. Again, I also want to thank you, YouTube, for giving us the opportunity to put our content out via our YouTube channel to you guys. Today's speaker will be Dr. Robert Haggard, who has more than 20 years of experience as the Director of Pediatric of the Sickle Cell Program at the UCSF Benny Hoff Children's Hospital. He is currently an internal medicine specialist at the Oakland branch. His course today will be talking about the updates with coronavirus, the difficult transitions for patients from childcare to adult care, the difficulties patients face in the ER department during a crisis, the steps hospitals are taking to improve medical data and patient history to better understand patients, and lastly, the new treatments for sickle cell patients that they should be taking advantage of. Once again, please stay after our session as we will be providing you opportunities as to how you can become involved in our organization, help us make it happen in 2020, and change the perception. Without further ado, get your notebooks and pens ready and we'll get right into it. Welcome to the Advocacy and Empowerment Program, Session 4 on Primary Adult Care. We are so excited to be getting back on track and thankful that all of you were able to join today for this great presentation of information from a great presenter. I am sure you will all find it useful and helpful. And by all means, if you have questions, please step up. Uh, you can put them in the chat box or you can raise your hand, whichever works for you. Um, I've muted all of the conference lines to eliminate background noise. And this session is being recorded. The recording link and PowerPoint slides will be sent to you after the presentation. And with that in mind, um, but before we get started, we're going to have Jason Gant, our mindfulness coach, take us through a little exercise and conduct the moment to arrive. Jason. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to do a quick mindfulness exercise called a moment to arrive. And we're all coming from different places, coming from different energies. Our minds are coming from doing different things and focus on different things. So right now we're just going to all get on the same page, get on the same place physically and mentally so that we can have a great session today. So I'm going to ring this bell. When you hear the sound of the bell, feel free to take a breath, a nice smooth inhale to exhale, finding a nice comfortable posture. If you can, having your feet firm on the floor, feeling the ground beneath you, Feeling that as support. Having your spine in a line, so sitting up straight. Relaxed shoulders. And with your heart up to the sky. You should be in a nice, comfortable, dignified posture. And we're gonna take this moment to arrive by bringing more awareness to our breath. And so I just invite you to take a breath at the sound of the bell.
Just connecting with your breath. Finding the natural rhythm. And seeing if you can notice when one breath ends and the next breath begins. Trying to notice that space in between. Between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose. That space can be recognized as the space between breaths. The space that's created when we recognize and we're aware of when one breath ends and the next begins. So when we're, when we're feeling frustrated, overwhelmed, feeling pain, keying into this space and into the breath allows us a little more spaciousness, creates a little bit more distance between us and the stress when we focus on the breath. Nice little self check-in to do before we get started. It's called a T check-in. A T check-in, T-E-A. And T stands for thoughts. Where are my thoughts? Checking in with where are my thoughts right now? As we're about to engage in this workshop. Advocacy and empowerment program. Where's my energy? E is for energy. And last A is for attitude. How is my attitude this morning? Thoughts, energy, and attitude. It's a quick check-in that we can do with yourself right now. <clears throat> As you're focusing in on your breath, just checking in, asking yourself, how's my thoughts? Where are my thoughts at right now in this present moment? How's my energy and where's my attitude? Lastly, I'm gonna read a quick passage. Just feel free to still connect with your breath and then we'll get started here. Quote by Mary Lee G. Adams, a question not asked is a door not opened. Question not asked is a door not opened. As a leader, it's your job to have the answers. Or is it? Whenever there is a designated leader, people look to that person for the answer. But they don't always really want that answer. Or the, or the leader doesn't always have it. Both solving problems and being decisive are essential to leading. Yet always having the answer limits your ability to engage and develop others and to create an environment that generates new thinking. When you find yourself immediately giving the answer, pause and ask a question. What do you think? What would you do? Your question draws others in. You create opportunities for growth and learning. And even if you think you know, asking a question opens the door for expanded thinking and the unexpected. So every time you find yourself giving the answer, stop and consider asking, asking a question instead. I invite you to be curious about your experience 
and to allow the opportunity to create the conditions to change your relationship to pain or to stress. This is going to be the last time I ring the bell. Make this your best breath. And then feel free to open your eyes if they're closed and come back to the group. Thank you. This was our moment to arise. <clears throat> Thank you so much, ladies and gents, for being a part of that uh, session. Just to make sure that you guys know, Jason Gant is our resident wellness coach for Sickle Cell Anemia Awareness of San Francisco. And throughout the week, he does have mindfulness activities um, and seminars that he does midday, and throughout the day for people who have break periods between their work schedules to uh, catch up on this portion of their psyche. Um, just so you said, it's a vital piece to our organization as well, um, because we are trying to really put ourselves in the forefront of helping people on a mental perspective. Uh, we understand that physically, a lot of things are hampered with the sickle cell community. And what we don't realize a lot is psychologically, that's also being tarnished at the same time. Uh, so it's important for us to make sure that whether or not you can get the full spectrum of health, whether it be physically, mentally, or psychologically, if you falter at one area, or if you're not getting the right information or the right help in that area, we are trying to do our best to bring the other side of that spectrum to you so that you can find a balance in your life. Um, so if you guys didn't know, um, he will be one of our presenters in the coming months, um, and he'll be able to give you guys some more information and more exercise on this process. A um, few things that I want to touch on really quickly, and I'm going to share the screen uh, before I get to Robert Hager. Uh, for those that are just new to the program, uh, please do us a favor so that we can disseminate this information to you by using the chat box on the side. I'm gonna share the screen and I'm gonna show you guys. All you have to do, oh, sorry about that. All you have to do is look at the bottom of your screen where you're in the actual, um, uh, 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 the, the platform for Zoom. And if you, put your tab, if you put your marker at the tab, it'll say participants, chat, share screen, record and reactions. In order for you to chat, to the right side of your screen in the box. You just put that on chat, click that chat button, and there'll be a message type bar for you. Uh, please make sure that you have any questions of some sort. Use that chat box so that we can get back to that during our Q&A. There'll be two sides of the presentation for this, this seminar. Um, Mr. Hager is going to speak to us on this first portion of the presentation after I complete myself. We'll break at 12 p.m. Uh, Jason Gant will send, will put us through, and we'll have a break, kind of like an intermission. And before we get back to Robert's second set, second portion of the session, we'll go through another wellness exercise that'll take about two to three minutes, uh, just to re-engage yourselves to the seminar so that you guys don't feel like you're stuck in place or stuck in mud. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about really quickly is, uh, we just launched our website. And we implore you guys to go to that and support us in respect to that. And I'm going to go to, I'm going to share this with you guys really quickly. Uh, let me get to my, let's get to it. This is our new website. We just launched today, Nadina Brox and Lawrence Fung. Lawrence Fung is one of our interns. 
He goes to Wallenberg High School. He's been working feverishly on this website to launch it this morning at 7 a.m. So when you guys get done with this seminar, at any point in time in the moving forward, if you guys can check out this website, we've got a whole lot of new features. We incorporate um, a page where you guys have the ability to give us testimonials and share your stories. Um, we have an opportunity for you guys to join us and become an advocate. We have opportunity for you guys to figure out when our next blood drives are. So please do your best to do that. Secondly, I want to spotlight Kristen Fung. Kristen Fung is Lawrence's sister. She is a, uh, a current student at UCLA. She's been working hard on editing all of our AEP videos, um, as well as other things that we have done as far as tabling or any other um, uh, conventions or seminars or um, um, hospital events or I'd say uh, health conferences that we've been a part of. She's created a YouTube channel for us. All you have to do in your taskbar, if you go to YouTube, is type in S-E-A-A-S-F, and it'll come up and you'll see some of the videos that she's put together for us. She is currently editing Keith Carrillo's first uh, session for AEP and Wanda Williams' session, which is our second session in February for AEP, and she'll have these up here for everybody to have a chance to actually look at the entire feed, the entire presentation. Um, if you missed it, so it, it, this is our way to give you give back to you guys. Lastly, for those that are a little bit more social media inclined, we have our Sickle Cell Anemia Awareness of San Francisco IG page. This is giving you guys updates on support groups that we will have in the near in the future, uh, giving you guys the opportunity to see some of the pictures of some of the conferences that we've been a part of, when our fitness days and so forth. Obviously, we are in a shelter in place and there might be a situation where the entire year is going to leave us without being able to uh, gather in groups. Um, so we'll have some adjustments for our annual walk this year and other events so that you guys can participate. Um, I'm going to stop sharing really quickly, come back to the page. Last thing I want to do before I get to uh, uh, Robert, I want to thank GBT for funding uh, our opportunity to provide essential care packages to our patient roster. Um, we just sent them out a few days ago. Nadina Brox did an incredible job of getting them all together. Thank you so much to our support staff, Aiden as well. You guys did an incredible job helping us get to this position to where we could actually make a difference in our community. Uh, so those that did not receive their packages, if you're on this call, please make sure that you type in your email and your address, your personal address, so that we know where we can send this package to you. It involves a, 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 a set of masks, um, reusable, where you can wash them. Um, there is some sanitizing products in there, and there's also a telephone for you guys to use for our hotline. Um, one thing I want you guys to make sure that you do, we have a lot of new people that are partaking into our uh, um, our AEP program now that we're on Zoom. Uh, before our first, our first presentations was for January and February, they were predominantly in person. So we had a, we had a set of registered uh, participants that were coming to our AEP program uh, uh, course trainings. So those people were able to get a binder like so for their AEP program. If you are one of those people that have participated prior, please continue to use this as your source of information to our presenters to know exactly who's coming on and what their bios are, but then also have the ability to take notes and so forth, because this information is definitely important for you to have, specifically if you're joining the journey or because you're in the journey. We are trying to create an opportunity to make a difference and provide some better health care, psychological care, and customer service care for all of our sickle cell patients in this community that haven't gotten this before. So you guys are our cornerstone. And these people that have these binders, I apologize for those that do not have these, but we're hoping to have an opportunity to recruit more people for this program. The longevity of this program is not nine months in our vision. We want this to be a year by year opportunity to where we can provide this to more sickle cell patients 
and recruit more advocates that are going to fight for this cause and be a help to our patients that are being admitted to ER that are going through these problems and don't have the ability themselves during those processes to communicate properly to people. They need help. And the more and more that we can get you guys to, 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 to join us, to become a part of this, this, this journey, become a part of this community. It's only going to make us stronger by the masses. One of the main issues, and I explained this in the AEP, in the town hall meeting we had, is we are, we are force in numbers. And the minimal amount of numbers we have just makes us less of a force. So you guys joining this cause, joining this crusade, joining this community is only going to make us stronger and it's going to force people to listen. The only way that we can commit to we can get people to commit to change is for somebody and a set of people to believe and follow, and that set of followers creates those people or gives those people no excuse but to listen to us. So, with that said, if you are new to this, you are a patient, you are just interested in our program. We need for you guys to put your email into the group chat so that we can get this information to you and possibly help you understand more about why it's important that you can make a difference in our community by just joining these calls. I know that we have a lot of people that don't have the opportunity to do so every Saturday, but to make your commitment is only going to make our program that much more sustainable. So treat this not only as a webinar of search to where you're just joining to get the information on a one-time basis, your commitment is what's going to make this change. And if you guys can commit, not necessarily your entire schedules, but just a Saturday a month, it's very simple, it's very easy. You don't even have to come on for an entire two to three hours that the seminar is going on, just that you have an opportunity to hear some of the information that can get you interested in our vision. It's going to change a life right away. And that might not just be yours, it might be somebody that you don't even know that you might get a chance to meet in the future. Um, the last thing I want to mention is with that saying, you guys giving us our emails, I will send you guys information as to what we want you guys to help us with if you can. Obviously, we're on a voluntary situation, so I'm not going to say that it's mandatory. All I'm going to tell you is employ you to try your best to become a part of us. That'll help us and it'll help us through leaps and bounds. Last thing before we get to Robert. Oh, let me bring it up really quickly here. Uh, sorry about that, guys. While he's reiterating, finding it, I just want to say that, yes, your dedication and support is great. And we win in numbers. So yeah. without you and making that presence and making people, making the society and the powers that be known about the situations that you all face um, is only a disservice. So, you know, when I call you or when the organization calls you, we're just trying to get your support so that we can make things better for the sickle cell community. Three things I wanted to leave you guys with really quickly, just so that you understand. The three principles of our program is continuation and longevity. The second thing is to give you guys the necessary information that you need in order for you to continue to understand how you can get help, how you can service a patient, or how you can be an advocate for the cause. And the last thing that we're basing, our, basing this on is your support us being able to give you guys a new opportunity to make a difference in one area that you may not have thought of before. All of us are incredibly healthy in certain, certain respects and those and others are not. Just like me having an incredible wealth of knowledge, it's this disservice to my community not to share it with my youth. For those that are incredibly healthy and understand how to push forth or give that, give that strength to another person, like a sickle cell patient that may not have the same opportunities you have, you are giving that person hope. If with hope, we can create something that nobody is going to be able to stop. And with that being said, I'm gonna turn this over to Robert Hager. Thank you so much and enjoy the seminar. 
Thank you very much. And thank you for the mindfulness exercise. Thanks everyone for taking their time out here. I was a little daunted when they said I had like two hours to, to speak here um, on a webinar. Uh, everyone, I saw a recent article about Zoom gloom, which after about 30 minutes, everyone starts fading out. So I, I like the idea of breaking it up. Um, I have a bunch of slides because I had a lot to cover, but I want to make sure people ask questions. I just don't want to be this as a lecture. Everyone's different. I'll be talking about a lot of things in general. A, a lot of things don't apply to everybody, but to kind of give an overview. And let me go ahead and before I start sharing the screen, I want to say a, um, a hello to Dr. Carrillo, uh, to Ms. Payton, who I see on here, uh, Dr. Love, and I, I, I saw one of my friends, Shari Porter, and I kind of recognize some names but don't have a last name, so I can't say for sure who they are, but welcome everybody. See here. All right. Does everyone seeing my screen now? We do. Everyone's yeah, seeing it? Okay. Good. Okay. Well, when uh, Ms. Prox asked me to to talk, um, oh, first here are some of my disclosures. We always do this. We do a lot of research. Um, there's a uh, GBT, of course, um, and several of the other um, groups that are and companies are interested in sickle cell. Uh, Ms. Brox asked me to go over a whole lot of stuff. First, uh, COVID-19 update, um, um, stress um, transition uh, from pediatrics to adulthood and why it's so hard, and then really talk about adult care, how to keep um, healthy and happy, and then you know, Ms. Payton's on here, and I know she already talked about this, and I've learned a lot from her about how ER visits can be challenging um, from the patient side. I'm going to talk a little bit more about from the doctor's side, and hopefully they'll give a dialogue um, area. And then also at the end, talk about some of the new treatments that uh, have come out over the last, um, actually, a couple years. Okay, first COVID-19 update. As of yesterday, this is what we were looking at in the US for a number of cases of sickle cell patients with COVID-19. There was 123 that have been reported that we know of. There have been several registries looking at this and trying to sort out what may or may not be going on, um, specifically with patients with sickle cell that um, get COVID. Um, the average age is a little bit younger and um, this is kind of the normal distribution that we usually see between, between everything. Age distribution is also kind of peaking around 20, but then it kind of drifts around all the way down. And of course, the ethnic um, distribution is pretty much as expected. This is where the cases are being reported from, not surprisingly, the Northeast, um, where especially um, New York, um, New Jersey is getting most of it. Another little pocket up in uh, Washington State. We really haven't seen any sickle cell patients in our area, though we definitely have COVID down here. There's a couple of patients I wish they had gotten tested, but they didn't. And they're starting to test more folks. Um, so, so far everyone's tested negative that's had to go in. Um, this is uh, something else that's important to know. Uh, remember, we had a total of 123 cases here. And then if you look, we've had 12 deaths. So roughly 10%, which is a little bit higher than what's being reported in most places. In Italy, the death rate was about 10%, um, uh, Sweden about 11%, and other places. So it's about the same as the most severe areas. Interestingly, other places like Germany and across the US, it's less than 10%. So there may be a little more, there could be a selection bias that they're only testing earlier on the patients that were more severely ill. And as you know, there's a lot of reasons we worry that folks with um, sickle cell could be worse because Anything that affects the lungs can just get a whole bunch of um, trouble started, which we'll talk about. The disease severity, I think it's also important to know, getting COVID so far has not been a death sentence. Um, over half the cases, almost 60% have been mild, um, with the with severe cases being around, oh, we'll say 18% um, going through, and 72% the symptoms just resolved. So it's um, still it's out there. It's still best not to get it, um, but it's not uh, but it's not necessarily if you get it, you're going to be really really sick. But we would worry and want anyone with any sort of lung troubles to make sure that we're um, watching them closely. 
Obviously the precautions, um, the, California has been kind of a leader in trying to keep people socially distanced and keeping things separated. Uh, sickle cell, we're looking at it as a potentially high risk condition from what we know. And since we have few, few COVID cases in our area, luckily we haven't had to worry too much about our folks with sickle cell, but we are um, keeping an eye out on this. And obviously you know, follow your current social distancing like we're doing by this webinar. I know a lot of my um, patients and friends have not been going to the ER because they're really concerned about catching COVID if they go there. And you know, it's, it's a tough time. And if you can manage at home, try managing at home. But if you're having trouble breathing, if you really have a high, high fever, if you think anything's going on with your brain, you're getting weak or think you might be having anything there, go in. You know, because it's still, you have sickle cell and we need to make sure you get um, taken care of um, appropriately. Any questions on that section? Are you advising people to call before they go into the hospital? Yeah, I actually was gonna to come to that, uh, Dr. Love, is that if they have a primary doctor or a sickle cell doctor, call them first so we can call ahead. And actually one of the part about keeping um, healthy is actually making sure you have a primary or a doctor that you are working with for just so, that sort of um, point. Uh, we just have a lot of patients and one of the things we're looking at here is there's still a lot of folks with sickle cell that we call unaffiliated. And <clears throat> we just worried that they're just not even coming in even when they get really sick. A lot of this data will be collecting as time goes on. But even if you can't reach your doctor, if you're having trouble breathing, you're thinking you're having a stroke, or the pain is really severe, you still need to go in. Um, most of the docs in, um, in the ER, you'll, when you get there, you realize everyone gets screened, they're getting temperatures, they're doing questionnaires, and a lot of places now are just starting to test everybody when they come in, and even the staff's getting regularly tested. So it's getting safer there, um, but if you can call, if you do have someone you're working with, like our um, um, patients would either call call us or during or our fellows and they would call in or if you have a primary they usually have some way to talk to them to make sure they know what they want them to do. All right, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Um, it's actually kind of hard to realize this but I think it's important for anyone dealing with the healthcare system in the United States to realize that sickle cell is a rare disease. We have 320 million people, is that the current? No, 200, yeah, it's about 320 million people, if I got that number right, people in the United States. And of that number, in the United States, there's maybe around 100,000 people with sickle cell. So that's a really small number. Around the world, it's much, much more common, as you know. But the, the point of that is that even if, you know, if you're a healthcare professional or a nurse or someone who's heard about sickle cell, and most people have, you don't see it all the time. You don't see it every day. And so when you're coming in, even to an area like in Oakland where there's more um, folks with sickle cell than other places, you're not gonna be a major focus. You're not seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis that you're really on top of the nuances of taking care. And that's why you have to become your own advocate as being stressed by all these other um, presentations. Um, the first description of sickle cell actually goes, best we can tell, is about 1847. There was this um, a gentleman right, um, traveling through Africa and he was talking about these fevers with pains in the joints, uh, long continuous and recurrent symptoms, suddenly seized on the muscular coat of the heart and pecu um, peculiar to the natives of the tropics. And that's probably a description of sickle cell because obviously it's been around for a long time. The sickle cell seems to have originated five times independently along the uh, equator. And the reason it seems to is that having the trait is somewhat protective against the most severe forms of malaria. Not sickle cell, sadly, but having the trait. Um, and that becomes, you realize why that's such a driver for um, evolution when you realize until recently, a quarter of the people that have lived and died in the history of the world have died from malaria. And so anything that gives you any little advantage over such a huge um, dangerous disease is going to um, persist in the population. And there's, um, four areas in Africa and one between India and um, Saudi Arabia that seems to have been where the, um, these genes independently um, uh, came up. In the US, obviously, it was first described in 1910. I, I don't really want to call it the discovery of sickle cell because it's been around for a while, but someone actually paid attention. 
and actually was in a um, dentist who lived a nice long life after his discovery, so probably had one of the milder forms. And then interestingly, there is even some debate whether King Tut had sickle cell. There are some articles published when they look at his bones or things that look like what we call a vascular necrosis, which would be typical of sickle cell. The sickle cell has been around for a long time. It's only now that we're really starting to, um, the last hundred years, um, really focus on it. And really only in the last 10 or 15 years of it, mom, really strides have been made. Why is the transition from pediatrics to adult medicine so hard? Um, I think uh, our, one of my um, director, Elliot Fajinski, and uh, one of his colleagues, Samir Balas, I don't know if it ever got published, but they wrote an article on this. And the, the first thing they said is, when you try to transition, you have to find a, an adult doctor who wants to see the patient. And that was actually one of the hardest things that they could do. And it's not that doctors don't want to take care of patients. If you haven't been trained in something, you don't feel comfortable, you just don't feel like you're doing the patient a service if you don't understand it. Just like I wouldn't take patients having hemophilia or breast cancer because I just don't do those. And they're such things you really want to be on top of. But it is important, and there's been a lot of um, um, work going on about training more doctors. In fact, Cal the state of California, and Dr. Carrillo had a lot to help with this, is now just put out this Northern California um, Sickle Cell Initiative, which actually has funding for adult sickle cell care, not research, not um, uh, papers, but actually to improve the care of sickle cell patients. We've started meeting, trying to figure out how to uh, expand out the program so there'll be more doctors that know enough about sickle cell to really help this. And the reason this is important is um, this has actually been replicated in several things, but this is Sophie Langstrom's um, publication back in 2013. What you're looking at here is a mortality rate per 100,000 African-American populations in the U.S. Notice um, 1980, we start doing better. Um, this is the adults, and these are the kids. The kids are continuing to do better and better and better. The adults were doing better and better and better until around 2000. And we've hit a plateau, and actually life expectancy overall has started dropping again for adults. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit why. Um, but that's actually something that's shown up. Interestingly, when you're looking at other places. Uh, this is work um, that we were um, part of with Susie, uh, uh, Susan um, Polakonis, comparing um, California to the United States and um, other folks at Duke and King's College in the UK. This is their median survival. They, they're continuing to go up um, when you're actually at a sickle cell center. However, in the general population in the US, even in California, it's coming down. We have data that I only have up here that if you're actually coming to a center, that your life expectancy is not decreasing. And we're not, not that we do anything that special, but we'll go over some of the reasons that probably is true. And it's important if you know this, even if you're seeing other doctors, that um, hopefully you can help them help you. So the thing is important about transition is that life expectancy is not continuing to improve in this country. So we just need to make sure people are, are getting in. And the problem is the doctors that they're going to is, is not as knowledgeable. And one other thing I didn't mention, which is important, is with all the best of intentions, when California set up their um, uh, Affordable Care Act, they made everything by silos in different counties. And so if you're a sickle cell patient in one county, you may not be able to come to a center, or you may not be able to get to the specialist that you need. Uh, Dr. Carrillo worked a long time on trying to help with that, and so he knows the complications of, of, of that. So there are things that are out there, but I'm happy to say that um, there is now monies and their training programs are being up and running. Um, we are actually, we run a sickle cell boot camp. Um, GBT has been a funder of this too. We have bring people in from actually all, all over the world at this point to go for, through intensive training and on the nuts and bolts of um, uh, detailed sickle cell care. So we're hoping to be reversing some of these trends, but they're, they're out there and we'll talk about why. Robert? Uh, yes. I have a question. Sure. How come the data only focuses on African Americans? What about the Hispanics? You know, there's, there, there's data on that too. I was just having to pick and choose, thinking we only had a couple of hours and trying to focus on our area here. Okay. Which is right, if you go to somewhere like um, Brossard County or um, a lot of Southern um, uh, Florida, uh, we have colleagues like Richard Lottenberg there, his 60% of his sickle cell patients are Hispanic. Oh. And so they're, they're out there. And we actually have some um, folks that for all the world should be Caucasian, they have sickle cell. 
So we know it's a multi-racial, multi-ethnic ethnic disease, but still, again, and depending on the area you're focusing on, yeah. this is kind of what I'm focusing on here, but you're absolutely right. There are okay. that too. Okay, good, thank you. Robert. Yes. Uh, just a uh, just quick story. Um, so I mentioned, I mentioned a, a young lady named Kristen Fung. Um, she's been a, uh, an intern for us uh, since her junior year at Wallenberg High School. She's currently at UCLA. Um, she got so into this, just my mentorship in general made her very intrigued about uh, our organization to where she did a segment at a rally at her school uh, uh, at Wallenberg on sickle cell and what's and why that's important for everybody to know. And this is in front of the entire school body. Um, she also spoke to her teacher about why this is not incorporated into the biology segment or like a, like a small short segment incorporated into the biology class uh, or uh, any type of class that involves uh, human physiology. All of a sudden, that teacher got intrigued to change possibly a bit of her course and add that segment into that. We are trying to create with uh, Kimball Torres, he's on here now, he's on here currently, we're trying to create more outreach to college universities or universities and junior colleges to figure out how we can kind of, you know, get them to actually make that important to put a short sec. Why do you feel like that's not important for them to put or create a segment for into undergrad or postgrad about sickle cell? Seeing as nobody's more knowledgeable about it. And there's, I completely agree with that. And there's two, two parts of that, though. One, you can hear about something, but unless you're seeing it regularly or getting refreshed on it, it just fades away. Just like right. I was saying, I kind of know about hemophilia, but I wouldn't deign to try to, you know, I wouldn't dare to try to take care of someone because I'm not sure I could do a, a good job, even though right. I can kind of talk about a lot of the molecular parts and what's going on and the inhibitors and everything. Um, but yeah, I think that the more awareness that's out there, I've been really happy to see some TV ads and some even people talking about sickle cell um, because if you don't have anything to connect it to, then you have no place to store that knowledge. Right. You know, so if you have some basic, then that will come in if it comes up. And it also just more normalizes sickle cell for a long time. I don't know if that's been your experience, but we do have had a lot of um, patients. It's luckily not now, but years ago, they just didn't want their friends to know they had sickle cell. Um, and so it was just wasn't normal. You know, it's like, it's not something you asked for. It's not something you did. It's, it's just, it is. And so we just need to help everyone take um, care of it. Um, any other questions? All right. The other thing though, okay, sickle cell is a rare disease. Even when you're talking to people um, in this area, they're not gonna have seen that that many people. They'll have kind of heard about it. And the other thing to realize is sickle cell is complicated. Um, I'm gonna go through some slides here. I'm not trying to overwhelm you, and I don't want you to really focus on it. I'm just going to show you the, the complexity of what's gone on with our understanding of sickle cell. And we're going to come back to that at the end when we talk about the newer agents. It would be a lot um, more focused presentation. But let me just kind of walk you through this. Uh, again, don't take notes and just kind of sit back. Um, sickle cell the work on it began in 1949. Linus Pauling um, so actually won the Nobel Prize twice. Um, uh, one of the things he won the Nobel Prize for, or as part of his work, was coming up with a technique that's used all the time in medicine now called hemoglobin electrophoresis, which is a fancy way of saying, if you take a current and run it through something, it'll separate by charge. And he actually came up with that idea thinking about sickle cell. He was at a meeting back when they, went, they did trains back and forth on the East Coast and going back to Caltech where he was a professor. Someone had asked him about the sickle cell and he was thinking, you know, I wonder if that's a protein change in the cells. So he took normal red cells and ran a current through it. And yeah, they separated into bands. Then he did sickle cells and he got different bands. And they cut out the bands and realized he had a different protein. And then they went on to actually find that it was a genetic disease. So sickle cell is the first genetic disease ever discovered. And they actually knew that it was um, a genetic disease. But yet it was like, it really took almost 100 years, well, not 100 years, um, 50, 60 years to actually start to get some treatment for it. Um, the basic that everyone hears about, and again, I don't want you to over-focus on these because I'm just gonna walk through some key things. And the point is, we're gonna look at this and I'll show you how many other things have become important in sickle cell. But if you have normal hemoglobin, which is the part of the, inside the red cell that carries oxygen, 
Um, it has oxygen and gives up oxygen. When it gives up oxygen at the, uh, in a normal hemoglobin, it just changes shape a little bit, but it doesn't do anything else till the next oxygen comes around that it carries. If you have sickle cell and you don't, and it loses its oxygen, you can actually start to form these long chains that have fancy names to them, but it's almost like a ratchet. You know, have you ever cranked up your car? The way the, um, the biology works is that as they're starting to sickle without oxygen, it keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. And that's what makes the sickle shape. It's actually pushing the cell membrane from the inside to make it elongate it because it's just ratcheting it up. And for, a, for until about 10, 15 years ago, they we, we all, this is obviously an important mechanism. We also think this, a lot of people thought this was the main mechanism of what was going on. But then what's happened over the last 15 years, and again, this is where I don't want to overwhelm you, but every one of these places and one of these interactions, first these are interactions between cells, um, white cells, red cells, and platelets in the bloodstream have all been shown to be important in um, sickle cell disease. And in, in mice models where you can take them and just isolate one or the other, you can almost get rid of sickle cell by blocking almost any of these one little paths. And there's just tons of them. And not only is that complicated, but then remember the blood has to go through the blood vessels. And don't forget blood vessels are alive. They're as alive as your, your nerves or your skin or your finger. And they have all these um, reactions that they do with the cells that are going by, they're grabbing onto. And that becomes another huge part of what goes on with sickle cell. And again, in mice models, if you can block this out, it's hard to give them sickle cell. And you know, if we were mice, we'd have cured sickle cell in many ways, but people aren't mice and it's all the interaction. You can imagine everyone tries to focus on one thing to take a look at and try to fix, but if you look at all the complications that the other things that are going on, it's just so much happening. So sickle cell is complicated. We wish you could find like a single thing to help. And that's why we're very excited about these newer agents because we can start mixing and matching, trying to cover a lot more of these um, areas. We're gonna come back to this slide later, but this is a more simplified way. This is representing actually the change in the DNA. This is where it's becoming deoxygenated and actually sickling and becoming the sickle cell. And then when this starts to happen, then the cell starts to fall apart. And then also these things start to stick to the adhesion and all of it winds up causing end organ damage. Dr. Dr. Hager? Yes. I had a question. Um, question involving the blood. Okay. So um, we have a few people that are on the call right now. One of her name is Claire, um, another is Catherine. They've participated in blood drives with us. Right. When we do, when blood drives happen, regardless of where the distribution goes, what is the blood that's, what is, the, because I know we, 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 we try to ask for sickle cell patients or people that have the trait to ask, uh, who, who do they need the blood from the most in a blood drive, for example? Where do they, what type of blood do they need or what type of procedure do people need to go through in order to truly help sickle cell patients? You mean by the donors? The blood donors? Yeah, the donor. The okay. donor. Yes, as many um, <clears throat> African American, <clears throat> excuse me. As many African Americans as we can get to donate, the better. Because yeah. when you're matching blood, and a lot of people need blood a lifetime, there's three main um, complications that a person who needs blood is going to have. They have to get regular blood. And many patients with sickle cell need regular blood because it's the best way to reduce stroke risk. It's one of the better ways to protect organs. And some people are just are always running so low on their hemoglobin that if they get blood, they can just function better. And they've tried other, other ways and it just doesn't work. We have people every day in our day um, hospital unit getting blood, either um, what we call strict transfusions or paresis. We also know, we've also modeled that over the next probably month, we're going to start running out of blood. Um, mm. Right now, with the, all the changes with COVID, all the elective surgeries and other things have also gone down. So the blood demand has gone down about 30%. Wow. But that's going to start kicking up when you can only push off surgery so long and lots of people get out there and donate and you can only store blood for so so long without having to freeze it which causes a whole nother thing um, but we're going to start having more trouble gotcha. if you're getting blood a lot um, you're going to need to get blood you worry about getting infections from the blood which is almost non-existent in the u.s right. you worry about getting iron overload which is real you can't do much about it but the other thing that can come up is you start getting if you start reacting to the blood that you get, you start making antibodies against blood types. Yeah. And that's where if the more you can get people from the same ethnic group to match, 
the less that will happen over time. We're okay. pretty good about matching it, but we still see antibodies every now and then. And there are places that, you, um, especially on the East Coast, they really push to have African-American blood for African-Americans because it seems to cut this down. There's, I guess, a, a lot of complicated stuff. But yeah, if anyone can donate, um, especially if you have like um, O negative, O positive blood, because that can give that to about anybody, then okay. they really should do that. But they could use any blood coming up probably over the next month or two. Robert, you got another question? Yes. There is a feeling of blood if you have a dormant core hepatitis. I can, I'm having a hard time hearing, sorry. What's the problem with giving, giving blood if you have a dormant B core hepatitis? A uh, problem of getting blood? Giving. Giving blood <clears throat> if you have hepatitis? No. Years ago, I was uh, detected when I tried to give blood, they had a, a B core dormant hepatitis. They said to consult a physician. I did that, but I have no issues. You never have had for the last 30 years. Huh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still having a little trouble hearing you. Can you type it in? Yeah, yeah we'll type it in, Robert. Okay. He wanted to know, uh, because he was diagnosed with a hepatitis B, uh, can he give blood? If it's active, unfortunately not, because that means there may be some in the bloodstream. If that was, if, if he was diagnosed years ago, it may be clear now. So he could, right. get, he could get tested. This, is year, this was years ago. Yeah. Hepatitis B, about 10% of people will go on to be chronic carriers, but most people clear. And most of that 10% are people from Asia anyway. So it may be worth going to your doctor and just getting a, um, a hepatitis B panel. And if you're clear, you're clear. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the last thing uh, before the break, um, this is something everyone was, one of the things that makes sickle cell so complicated, everyone has their own version of it almost. They have their own pain syndromes where their pain starts, their own course. And if, if I showed you all that complicated stuff before to show why everyone can come up with a different pattern. Looking at it, depending on whether the cells are falling apart over here or just getting more stuck to the red cells over here, we kind of think about um, sickle cell and kind of different subtypes, whether the cells are falling apart, the so-called hemolytic subtype, or they're just, um, they're, they're just sticking too much around to the platelets and the white cells, the so-called viscosity type. And you can, actually, you can actually see they kind of cause different sort of troubles. Interestingly, I want to point out like the pain crisis, because folks that have really low hemoglobin tend to have fewer pain, but they have more severe troubles between acute chest and actually um, stroke when they're younger. And people that have higher hemoglobins um, actually have more pain, um, but they have less of sometimes of the more serious stuff, especially when they're little, but they over time as they go become older, they start to have more um, complications. Um, so most people are somewhere in the mix and you can actually kind of shift back and forth depending on what your hemoglobin levels are doing. Again, this is what makes it so complicated. What's interesting about this is that we've had several studies that we've tried to do to raise hemoglobin, and with the exception of uh, hydroxyurea and hopefully GBT products, uh, Foxellator, everything that has raised the hemoglobin has caused more pain, and the studies have had to be stopped. So if you got sickle cell, you don't really get a break. You got this sweet spot you're trying to find. If you get your hemoglobin gets too high, your pain kicks up. If it gets too low, you get more serious complications. And so that's uh, an area that we're, we're working on. Um, and that's why well, when we talk about agents, or why the things we've tried to do everything we want to, we can actually almost stop hemolysis if the hemoglobin goes up and the pain goes up and other troubles. So it's kind of an intriguing, uh, it's, it's why it's not simple and it's been hard to, to work out. I think we have, at that point, yeah, um, we have points to take away. Sickle cell affects almost everything in the body. <clears throat> How it causes pain is poorly understood between all those different things I showed you. There are great differences between patients, and many, many factors change how any individual person experiences their sickle cell. And all that goes together to make it challenging for people that don't really work with, even with the, those that do work with sickle cell a lot, but especially for those who are just seeing a couple of patients or maybe in the ER, 
trying to figure out what to do. It's just hard to understand all the different parts. And then we're moving into transition after that. Um, let's go ahead and just do that real fast and we'll take a break. Um, when people become 18 and move to adult care, um, we're unique in our center, probably in the country, because our pediatric program, and Dr. Carrillo used to run it, it's just down the hall and we just had people move over up the hall, so we kind of knew everybody. But still it was a challenge because of changes in insurance sometimes. But for the general, in the country, a lot of people when they turn 18 are just told goodbye, go find somebody. And so unless they've really been transitioned, they need to be able to find a provider, and then on the patient side, I don't know if all of us remember being teenagers, but usually you just want to kind of forget you have any trouble, live your life, quit taking your meds. You want to assert your independence. You finally have been told what to do all your life. Now you can say no. And so that actually is a start. And you're kind of just wanting to be normal with everybody else. So you're kind of trying to build this in to help this happen. But the problem is um, what we see um, when people transition, this is less than 18, this is the age 18 to 30, 35 to 50, the usage just shoots up for, house, for healthcare usage, and even um, proportions of death starts to go up. And we're not completely sure whether this is just an accumulation of disease or there's some other factors, or if you can go to a center or a knowledgeable provider, um, will this help? It does seem to be that there is at least a big part of this, you're just not getting complete care at this age, these ages. And that's setting you up for the problems here. And so that's why transition we focus so much on trying to identify early on. At our place, about 13, 14, we have a dedicated social worker starting to work on transition to identify adult doctors to go to and so hope that trend, hope that shift. Because what starts to happen if they don't have that in place by the time they get here, it all, it's very hard to kind of have that happen. And then also, as I said over here, what has been looking at several publications between the CDC and the major journals, 18 to 30 is the highest inpatient ED use, and also the highest 30-day return. Even when people leave, they come, they come back the, and the most. And it may well be that this are, um, the, the rates go up when they're not transferred to adult providers, especially with sickle cell centers. And again, not saying that we're doing a whole lot of things differently, but we're also focusing on a bunch of stuff which we'll go over. Um, so I think it's a good take, to take, um, take a break and we'll come back. We'll start talking about how to keep healthy, talk uh, briefly about ER visits from the doctor point of view and the new meds and that hopefully we'll, we can do that without losing everybody um, from Zoom gloom. Okay, everyone. Um, so as of right now, we've hit our break. Uh, we're gonna take a couple minutes for everybody to get something to drink, uh, go to the bathroom really quickly. Um, and at about 12.08, in between 1208, 1209, we're going to have uh, Jason come back with his second wellness um, um, presentation for us just to gear us back into um, the uh, second portion of Dr. Hager's presentation. I'll have an update for you guys as well. Uh, so I'm going to leave you guys for right now. We'll be right back in about a minute and a half, two minutes. Catherine, where you been at, girl? Unmute yourself. You got? Can you unmute yourself? Go to unmute. Let me see. Go. There you go. I try to be quiet here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find you. Oh my God! Hi. Oh, Dina, great to see you too. Oh. Yeah. I miss you. Yeah, I miss you guys. I've texted with uh, Angie a few times, but other than that, you know, haven't heard from anybody or, you know, don't stay in touch with them. Oh, man. It's, oh, it's, it's tough. I, I, I was talking to Angie before it all happened. She was like, hey, you know, we're probably going to shut down, Antoine. I was like, you know, it's going to be torture. She's like, dude, <laughs> I'll try to make sure that I don't eat too many cupcakes till we get back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Claire. Hey, Claire. I love you, Claire. I love you too. It's so hard not seeing everybody. I oh, want to touch you, Claire. I want to touch you. <laughs> 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 I just, I oh, it's hard. It is, but it's good to see you all. It really I is. Know. It really right. is. No, like, sorry, I missed the last couple. If don't I don't put worry. it down in my calendar, it doesn't happen. 
No worries, sweetheart. It's good to see you. That's all. Yeah. Oh my God. Wanda, it's good to see you too, sweetheart. Wanda's right next to Claire right now, so I'm just gonna say, hey, Wanda. <laughs> I just, it's just good to see everyone. It is. Have you guys been doing any exercises at home? You know, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of walks. Lots of walks. I'm sick of walking. I'm sick of, I don't even want to talk about walks. I know. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I keep trying to get lost on a walk and find new places I haven't been on, but that's not working so far. It's, it's yeah. all old, old routes, old roads. Yeah. But. It just means you got to walk somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. But within five miles. Right. There you go. There you yeah. go. Amma, good to see you. Thank you. Gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Amma. Hi, how, how are you doing? Shoot, girl, your hair look cute every single time you get on here. Like, <laughs> Dude, hook me up with your hook me up with your stylist because I need to cut. I need something. <laughs> oh man. Okay, guys. So um we'll be getting back to it in the next minute or so. Um if you guys can, um just to give me an idea that you are back, can you unmute yourselves? Not everybody has their uh Video. going on in here because uh, not everybody has uh their video on so it just gives me an opportunity to know that everybody's back if they unmute okay. themselves. all right everybody see me hello yes sir i see you tyree okay, okay. hello hello everybody all right. hello. Hello. pastor hello. timothy nina jamie i'm here welcome tony good to see you nina how do you work this thing? Colleen, you here? Good to see Can you. Can you hear Linda. me? Adrian? Yes. Gotcha. Colleen, you there? Oh, crap. Is that me? Yeah. Martin, you there? Yeah, me. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh. Jose? Jose, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Awesome, awesome. Keith, you here? Hello? Okay, so we're going to get back into it. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick update. Um, I talked about the essential care packages that we just sent out um, to a predominant amount of our patient community. Uh, we were waiting for this to happen based on completion of the course. So completion of the course. So this is this AAP program is a course training that's supposed to span over nine months. And the idea behind that is to give you guys tools and resources, uh, whether it be patients, whether it be advocates, uh, whether it be caregivers, anybody that's in the community, giving you guys as much tool, resources and service possible so that you can always be prepared at a moment's notice. Obviously we can't prepare ourselves for the pain crisis that we will experience, whether it be you looking from uh, outside in, or you being the person actually with the experience, but we wanna try to do our best to give you guys some type of mechanism to know that you're secure. Um, and in the backpack, the backpack was gonna be given to you guys upon completion. So that means after the nine months was over, you complete the course because you've been with us through the whole time, we're gonna give you a backpack. The contents of the backpack are a blanket, a water bottle, a journal. Journal's very important. In Wanda Williams' um, past presentation in February, she talked about having a journal so that you guys can journal your experiences, but then also have notes about the people you've spoken to. So if you need to go back to that to help somebody understand your circumstance or at least advocate for your circumstance, they'll have a history of, of knowledge for that. Um, and then also be coming in there would be a phone. So if you guys can see the phone that I have in my hand, this phone here has now been given to all the people that got essential care packages. 
basically there are three lines associated to the phone that you can speed dial in case you are admitted to ER and you are having trouble understanding how to communicate to a nurse about what you're dealing with. You can use this phone to give a call to somebody that can do the explanation better for you. The only thing that we will be doing with this phone is helping you guys get better help service when you're at ER or admitted in the hospital so that the accommodations work for your situation to get healthy at a faster rate. I'm going to give this over back to Jason. He can go through our next mindful uh, wellness uh, session. All right, so how's everyone doing? We're gonna, this is gonna be a much uh, faster exercise, but we did the T check-in, so just going on to the next level of the T check-in, asking ourselves about energy. This exercise will increase our energy, strength, and vitality. So feeling your feet on the floor, just wiggling your toes right now. Connecting with nice smooth inhale to exhale. And so now I'm going to introduce thumping, or also called tapping. And it's tapping your thymus gland. So this gland stimulates your immune system, giving it a boost. It keeps the thymus gland active and it stimulates energy. So we do this just your thymus gland is right here, like in the middle of your chest, in the middle of your sternum. And all we do is we're just Just tapping, not trying to this gland, and just by giving it a little energy, a little awareness, we give ourselves a little energy. Wakes our immune system up. So just for the length of three breaths, a full inhale to exhale, just continue this time is tapping close on the third breath. So the first breath in till just connecting with your natural rhythm. And your last breath Inhale, and now, now do some stillness, three more breaths at your own pace, and connecting back with the group. Nice deep inhale, nice and smooth exhale. Last breath, nice and easy. Breathing in all that energy and letting out, letting go all of what does not serve you. Thank you. Uh, before we resume, I'd just like to find out who is 415 655 3277. Hello? I'm just trying to find out whose phone number is 655-3277. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. 
I don't know who that is. Robert, you got the floor. Without Robert, further ado, we go to the second present second portion of Robert's presentation. There you go. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, I see the controls now. Okay, they disappeared for a second. All right, let's talk about adult care. Um, it's, now I'm gonna be talking about a lot of conditions. They don't apply to everybody. Some of it's gonna sound very gloomy about things that can happen, but the good news is we are doing better and better. Um, people taking care of themselves, learning how to take care of themselves, advocate for themselves, and we're getting better at being better doctors for them. Uh, we run an over 50 clinic here and we're having more and more people join the clinic so people are getting are, are doing well for a long time um, but things can, can continue to happen there are several peaks that happen to folks with sickle cell many of them in childhood between strokes um, severe splenic sequestration severe infections um, and some uh, acute chest that can happen um, so by the time you become an adult you've actually gotten by a lot of problems that are probably not going to be your issue. A lot of people, when they think about sickle cell care and to be healthy, and when we talk to other doctors and residents that are seeing patients, they go in, they come out, and they've interviewed the patient and goes, oh, they're doing great. They're not having any pain. Well, that is great, but you know, if you have sickle cell, every sickle cell in your body is sickling every couple of minutes. And so things are still going on and happening. And one of the things that we have really understood over the last five years or so and it's becoming much more of a focus of adult clinics is that the care of the adult is the care of your organs. We call them end organs because they're the end of the blood supply and you know, care of end organ um, damage. If we can keep those healthy, um, then you're healthy. And if, you're, and if you can keep those healthy, then you can usually keep your quality of life up, which keeps you happy. Um, it is very important also when I'm going through this, it'll, it is a little clinical, but it's so important to realize that people who have connections and support groups and friends um, just do better in general. So it's not completely just an, an organ presentation. That's why organizations like this are just so important to the community because all the support you can give people, people just do better. And um, complications aren't nearly as severe and it's all these complex interactions. All that stuff I showed you before that was just really complicated was to let you know that there's a lot of things that are going on. All right, so sickle cell disease and um, this day and age, and interestingly, um, this is the first time in human history we've had this many adults with sickle cell disease. Um, way back when, uh, if you had SS, you probably didn't survive till age five. And unfortunately, that's still the case in a lot of um, uh, low resource areas in the world. Um, and then those that lived a little bit longer often didn't live beyond 20. A lot of my um, patients that are, um, I won't call them old, but they're not 12 anymore, um, about 35, 40 and up, were often told when they were kids that they're not gonna make 20. And so it just shows you how much of a change has been. Sickle cell is now a chronic disease. We, we think about lifespan treatment because we really expect people to be around. Um, especially if we can kind of help with the more severe um, things that can happen in childhood, which the pediatric programs like Keith Carrillo ran, we're really good at, and then get into the adults and help protect their organs. There's no reason not to expect um, a long life. And so the care of adults has become the care of end organs. And again, I stress, even when they're not having pain, sickle cells are constantly sickling. And every time they do it, there's little things that are going on in the body that you have to watch for. So the up Patient preventative care, again, remember there's only about out of 320 million people or so in this country, only about 100,000 with sickle cell, and about 60,000 of those, 70,000 have the SS type, about 25, 30,000 the SC types are even rarer, and those with the s thal and s plus and other rarer variants are even rarer. So you're just not going to be seeing people that know a whole lot about this usually. We have more adults living. We have sickle cell. We're really worried about ongoing cumulative damage um, to, to organs. And the other thing that's so critical to stress is that as you're becoming an adult, unfortunately, sickle cell doesn't protect you from anything else. You get all the other stuff that you get, 
um, that your family history gives you, your family genes give you, and it interacts with sickle cell. One of the un interesting studies that Susan Policonis and we did, we were looking at um, ca uh, causes of death, trying to figure out what adults with sickle cell were dying from when they were older. And what we actually ran into, and Susan is, was brilliant at figuring out how to, she came up with this way to look through big data and actually figure out actually who had sickle cell, whether they said they, the chart said it or not. And then she did the hard work of going back and validating that by actually looking at the charts and then using that method to look at it. But once you cross about 40, 45, sickle cell kind of drops off your chart. And so we're really not sure what's going on with adults as they get older because we can't track them the way we um, kids get tracked going through. And the reason that drops off the chart is all these other conditions are really coming to the fore, whether it's the usual adult diabetes, blood pressure, or the other issues, cholesterol, heart disease that are coming up. So the other thing is important, and I'll keep stressing this, is why when you're becoming an adult, you need a primary care doctor who knows these conditions and can help you with those too, because they become a major determinant of your health as time goes on. And then also just your medical and social needs change a lot as you become a parent, as you become older. And so all these things are just part of just general good care, but then you have to add the sickle cell on top of it. Again, stress you, sickle cell doesn't protect you from anything else, and everybody needs a primary care provider. And the other reason that's even more important in California, and we run into this a lot in our clinics and for the adults, is that since they divided up the insurance the way they have, we've lost our ability to refer. We can't refer someone who needs to see a dermatologist for a adult skin problem. They have to go through their primary, and if they don't have a primary, they just can't get there. So we spend a lot of time trying to make sure people have primary care providers so they can, get the, they can have the resources available, because we just want them to have as many options as possible. And if you wait until it, you need one, that's really hard to get in. Uh, so we really, one of the things in our transition is to make sure everyone has an identified primary that they've actually seen already. Um, before transition happens. And that's actually to allow them if they need something that we can't provide to the sickle cell center, they actually have a way to be able to get to what they need. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes. Dr. Hager. So my question is, it's, it's really kind of general and I don't expect a specific answer, but why is it it's so difficult? Why, why when, when, the move, when the transition is about to occur, how come there's nothing really in place for that? My son got lost in the shuffle. Yeah. By the rest of that, so if, if we know that we need to before the transition begins, why haven't we tried to bridge that or, or make huh. that a better process? We've actually, there's been a lot of work trying to work on this. And unfortunately, what, uh, you don't want to be interesting to, it's, you don't want to be interesting to a research person that is still intriguing, that it's still hard to do transition. One, I'm going to say two things. The first thing, in a lot of the country, they don't pay it that much attention to transition. And at 18, congratulations, you're 18, go find a doctor. And that's kind of the transition. And even in places in California, I've had some um, people tell me that they would be in the hospital, in the children's wing, or like, uh, like, like down south, and they, it's their 18th birthday, the nurses have a cake, and then they actually put them in a wheelchair and wheel them over to the adult side. And it's kind of like, you're done. So that's bad. But even with groups, um, and there are many groups around the country that really try to improve this, and even our group, which works probably one of the more, working through Marsha Treadwell, one of the more intensive attempts to transition, we run into a couple of things, one of which is um, um, we start at the age of 13, 14, we have checklists of what they should be able to do, we have them practicing things, we try to, looking at their insurance, we have our social workers, help try to identify doctors for them. And it's still hard, even with all that support. Um, we also don't just make people transition at a certain age. We try to make sure everything's in place before they leave here, but it's, this is an, an unusual place um, for, for that. But trying to find providers that can take the insurance and are taking patients is hard. And then to be fair, you know, there's a thin pancake without two sides. A lot of these um, young adults, they just want to be they just want to forget they have the disease. They just want to be normal. They often just decide they don't want to come to appointments for a while. The usual teenager behavior, if I can say that. And even though we're trying to tell them that's coming and they're still here for them, sometimes they just want to get out there and not have to do anything. And so it really is a, 
multifactorial yeah. problem that has resisted a lot of serious work by some very dedicated people. I think transition happens a lot better in places like this, but it's still not perfect. And we've just I, seen people just disappear. Yeah, and, and I really think that's due to the, um, the amount of professionals that are in this particular field. Yeah. And this will could really be where organizations like yours, if they're at least uh, calling you when they go to the ER, at least we have some contact and hopefully we can get them better plugged in as they need and that they want to be. Uh, but yeah. yeah, that's an excellent question. Definitely. And, and we're hoping to be a bridge for that so yeah. that we can assist with that whole process. Because like I said, you know, my son just fell through the cracks and we did what we had to do or what was available to us. And it's just unacceptable. So it is. I appreciate you elaborating on that. And I, I look forward to working with the other institutions in the future to yeah. try to. And part of it is, again, the way the pediatrics and the adults are broken up. A lot of places, um, uh, Julie Cantor, who's um, now the director at Alabama, has come up with the term lifespan model, which a lot of people have been trying to go to, where you don't want to get rid of people. And a lot of childhood diseases that, or prior childhood diseases, adult doctors and hematologists just don't know how to take care of. There you go. I mean, and even if you go quote to an adult hematologist, they probably don't know sickle cell. Right. Um, we've, that's why a lot of people come over, even for adult doctors, come and work with us for a year or so, just to get a better understanding of the nuances of how to really take care of someone with sickle cell, you know, versus, oh yeah, I've kind of read about it, let me try this. Um, okay. All right. Great, thank you. So again, to stress this, Sickle cell doesn't protect you from anything else. You're going to get it, you know, we're going to get the usual adult things. I can say that too, because I'm not 12 anymore either. Everything just runs together, sickle cell. And actually, th that interaction is not completely clear. And we do know that how well your organs are working is, becomes your major factor in your quali quality and quantity of life. Um, in general, you know, healthcare, and it's, you know, if you're not taking care of, even if you're just seeing your sickle cell doctor, and but you're not taking care of your blood pressure and cholesterol, you're going to get heart disease. You know, so it, all these things are going to come up, and that's going to be complicated by the sickle cell. Um, all right. So again, a lot of these things I'm showing you is not going to happen to everyone, but I want to stress what's going on. This is. A, I just want to point out the date. This is 1970. Was one of the first um, publications of this. Uh, these are old photomicrographs, so they're not as pretty as the ones we'd have now, but this is what goes on in a kidney. This is a normal kidney. This is a kidney with someone with SC, and this is a kidney um, with someone with SS. And if you actually look at the ages, this is someone who is 72 years old. This person is five, and this person is three. And what you're focusing on here is the kidney is actually, you know, it's an interesting organ. It's where things get filtered um, and water gets concentrated. This is the outside of it, called the cortex, which is a Greek word for bark. And these are the, what are called loops of Henle, which go down here where all the action happens. Now, about 10% of these loops go all the way down. That's where you, you concentrate your urine, and you're able to handle your acid base um, and, your, and your kidneys. Kidneys do a lot of stuff. Okay, and then over here, this is someone who's five years old, and already you're missing a lot of these down here. There's less and less and less of them. Here's someone with sick, SS sickle cell, and they're three, and they don't have any. And this, and this is why almost everyone with SS type has, you know, they have trouble concentrating liquids. You're peeing a lot. That's why we always having you drink liquids because you can't hang on to them. And this is also why now, which you may or may not know, since there are many adults on the line, the, the standard of care now is a, if it's a little child is born with SS sickle cell. At the age of nine months, we're starting them on hydroxyurea because we're preventing this from happening. We're already getting data that shows they're hanging on to their kidney function far longer. And these are the sort of things that as we see people get older, part of our job at our adult clinic is seeing what's happening to go back and circle back and try to figure out what we can do to help prevent those further things from happening. And so that's one of the main things is kidneys we realize are one of the main areas that we look at to see how healthy someone's going to do, uh, how active their sickle cell is. There are two places in the body where sickle cell just does not like to be. One's in the spleen and the other's in the kidney because of all the factors they are going to be sickling all the time. So kidney care is very important. 
And then these are some older data. And again, these are changing as we're getting better at uh, adjusting things. But people that are over 35, um, with uh, older folks with sickle cell, 42% of chronic kidney disease, if you check for it. And it, called, it seems to be causing about 50% of the deaths in older folks. Or th These are, again, older data that now we're focusing more and more on taking care of kidneys. This, this was from about, I'm trying to remember the publication. I should have written it down here. It somehow fell off. I think it was about 10 years ago. Um, chronic renal failure is one of the most common, was the most common cause of death in a very big study called the Cooperative uh, Study of Sickle Cell Disease. Um, and it was a, and this was, that was published in 1990, early 1990s. And in California, when we just took a look, uh, again, kidney failure was the primary cause of hospitalization in people over 50. So kidneys are really important. And one of the things we focus on in our clinic is really taking care of those kidneys. Um, and the, you know, this, and I'm gonna go through a couple of organs and say what kind of why, how a center looks at things. Every quarter we look at not only just how the kidneys are functioning, but also how much protein is spilling, which is the idea of how intact they are. And then we really take a, a close look at them. And if they have any issues, we start treating that and getting them to a kidney doctor. We've had several people that we've actually just transplanted them for kidneys and actually um, make sure that we're there for them because a lot of people don't feel like a lot of transplants, or UCSF is getting better at it, but a lot of transplant centers wouldn't even consider folks with sickle cell. But we just, you know, we, you know, we're there to advocate for them that really is not that much difference in the life expectancy of a kidney. We even have one patient that's had two kidneys. Um, so it's a matter of keeping a close eye on your kidneys. Unless you're going to someone who knows what they're doing, most people that screen their kidneys are not looking at this at these on a regular basis. And this is like one of the things that a center would do that perhaps a, um, a less knowledgeable primary care doctor um, would not know to do. So kidney screening. Uh, I have a question on the kidney. So sure. If you have kidney failure, does that mean, you know, once you have kidney failure and you're on dialysis for a sickle cell patient, what does that mean? How long can they last on, 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 yeah. on dialysis? That's actually an excellent, uh, sadly, an excellent question. I actually, I think I took those slides out because I don't, if your kidneys actually fail, we really try to get you transplanted because the life expectancy after a failed kidney with someone with sickle cell is actually less than the general population. Yeah. So we really try to, try to keep you from getting there. And part of this, why I say where things interact, part of keeping a kidney healthy is keeping your blood pressure under control. Part of keeping your kidney healthy is quit smoking. Part of keeping your kidney healthy is making sure your diabetes, is, if you have it, is controlled. Because all these things pile on. And once we really start to see this start to happen, we get really aggressive as a clinic, trying to get people to really take care of themselves um, to help protect those kidneys. Because once it really fails, it's not, you know, it's not bad, it's not, um, it's, it's a bad sign. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we can slow this progression dramatically um, if we can um, kind of work with this. And again, this is what a center would do knowing, knowing sickle cell and hopefully a knowledgeable doctor would be seeing that they'd be seeing that they start to see the increase in protein and they really start right. talking to the person about we need to do this you know this is what we're looking at help you know let, um, this is what we recommend how can we help you get this done okay thank you same thing with um with um, um brain disease i mean the big organs in the body for sickle cell are, are a lot of, all the organs are important and i didn't talk about all of them but obviously um heart brain and kidneys are some things to really really focus on but if you actually look when you have SS disease, again, these are earlier data, again, about 10 years old, before the really aggressive treatment for stroke and other things. But by 20 years of old, 10%, of, 11% of people had overt strokes, which means clinically had a sign. Um, SC, it was about 2%, but notice it increases. But if you have SC type, you have more likelihood to have stroke when you're a little bit older. And that's another little bump we started to see. Um, and then as sickle cell here, the same thing, it keeps on growing. And it's actually, there are two types of stroke we talk about. One is over, which means something got weak, you're having some trouble, you actually feel it, or you have a, a clinically thing. And then we have what are called silent stroke. Oh, this is again, over silent strokes is here. We'll come to that. Um, this is just showing that there is um, JJ Strauss, who's now at Duke, was looking, just check, tr tracking these things. And there is an increase of stroke after the age of about 40. 
Now, whether this, you know, this is one of the things that is playing a little bit into the mortality. Not all of these strokes are sickle cell, though. Again, some of these are blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. Again, why everything starts to interact, and why you, you know we stress that primary care doctor makes sure everything is being worked at. We do our best to try to help and try to help people with their primary troubles and blood pressure and all. But unless they're getting regular follow-up, we we just need to make sure they get to the recommended targets, or they just or at risk for all these other things. Um, this is something that we've also noted that we're still trying to sort out what's going on. I think Keith was involved in some of the early studies with this with the kids here. Um, this, these are called cyber, uh, sorry, silent cerebral infarcts, and they're called silent because clinically you can't pick them up. What we've started to notice as our imaging has gotten better is that you can see more and more little small changes in the brain, and they happen at such an earlier, earlier age. I'm at the age, I've, I'm sure I've got them, um, but when you have sickle cell, it just happens sooner, and you can almost add, you know, it's way too quick. So there is something that's probably related to very tiny small vessels, sickling, and um, that the, it's going on, in the, the sickling going on in the smallest vessels, but these are slowly accumulating over time too. Um, and this is again something that we start to check for as in an adult center, where we um, do like an MRI every couple of years, um, looking if we see them increasing, then we talk about more disease modifying treatment earlier than later. We don't want to wait until we see more trouble happening before we actually start working with trying to prevent this. Um, acute chest is off something that comes up too, and this can lead to, to damage. This is actually a mucus plug that was pulled out of somebody um, with acute chest. You can see why people would have trouble breathing. If you imagine that's like a cork stopping up a bottle with all the branches of airways going off, it just you just can't breathe. And just the, the liquid that comes out of acute chest, this is not bilirubin from blood, this is just plasma. This is leaking. And it just actually causes some wild things that can cause it about 20% or sorry, 10% are caused by actually when you have severe pain in the arms and the legs, the bone marrow can sickle like anything else. And this is actually some bone marrow that you, is in the lung. It broke off and traveled to the lung and got jammed there causing acute chest. And about 10% of acute chest is caused by that. And all these things that they're happening too often over time start to scar the lung down. So you're not exchanging oxygen well enough. And so that just kind of gets this vicious cycle going. So if we see people that are having you know, one or two acute chest episodes, we really get aggressive about disease modifying um, um, therapies. And just like if you're having, hopefully not, but if you've had a couple of acute chests, you need to talk to your doc about, am I on enough you know, disease modifying treatments to keep these little things from continuing to happen? Um, the last thing to mention just for a general organ is that there's the other thing if you're not getting screened for it, there's something we call pulmonary hypertension. This is where the pressures are just high in the lung. You can have normal blood pressure, but the lung pressures are high. And if that starts to happen and crosses a certain threshold, your life expectancy really starts to drop off. And this is something we track people for. We have once a year, we actually check them to see if their lung pressures are going up. And but it is, again, this whole idea of what we can do to intervene. Luckily, not everyone gets all of these things, but these are things that can happen slowly and sneak up on you that you're not aware of, even you're not having a whole lot of pain. And these are the things that knowledgeable doctors and hopefully center, and I'm sure centers are doing just to help keep track of the other things that are really specific to sickle cell to make sure that we're looking at all the different parts that we can help the person keep us healthy for as long as possible. And again, these are some of just the screening stuff that we um, are looking for. Uh, these are a lot of these are fancy words, but again, keeping track of the heart, which I want to mention at the end in a second. The lungs, you know, if you've had acute chest, to make sure if you, you're smoking, they need to quit. If you have asthma, you're getting that treated. Then the making sure the kidneys, if they're having trouble, they're being um, taken care of. Um, and also just to make sure your vaccinations are up to date. We still have um, a lot of patients who just don't want to get vaccinated for reasons, and we try to be as supportive as, you know, we are supportive as we can, but it really is one of those preventable things. I mean, any time you get a vaccinatable, preventable disease, I feel like I've kind of failed somebody somehow if I can't get them immunized. And then these yearly tests we do, you know, we look for hepatitis and especially hepatitis C, which now we can treat actually. Um, we keep try on the livers and the kidneys. Eyes are very, very important. That's something I didn't mention earlier, but the, you can have subtle changes in the eye and then have a sudden bleed and lose vision for the rest of your life. If, if you see it early, you can fix it. 
So once a year, we have everyone get eye checks just to make sure that we don't see this coming up. We look at the heart very carefully, and actually we're getting more and more interested in the heart. I said before that this is the first time we've had so many, but luckily so many folks with sickle cell getting older and older, and we're starting to see some unusual heart things happening to a subset of people about the age of 40, 45. It seems to be something very unusual with the microvasculature going on, and it's been <clears throat> quite serious, and there's been several groups, mainly um, Eric Kraut at Ohio State and all is trying to put together a research program to take a look at this. But we're starting to do echoes a little bit more frequently and in a slightly different way to make sure that the, the tissues are working well on a heart, because there are, seems to be a subset of folks that this may be an issue that, again, we're picking up, and as we learn about this, we're going back to the younger folks and really trying to take a look to see if we can track this through and see if there's anything else we can do to help. Um, and then this funny word squid down here, it's just a way, it, it stands for a superconducting um, quantum um, interference device, which is a fancy way that we look at iron in the liver to see if you're iron overloaded from the blood because iron overload over time just does a lot of damage. If you're on regular transfusions and no one's paying attention to your iron, there's something else that needs to be done. All right, and these are the ones that we used to get every two years and we kind of talked about them already, the lung tests, the heart tests, the brain tests and we keep an eye on your bones and the electrocardiograms, uh, echocardiograms to make sure that um, we're not seeing any increase in pressure in the lungs. Okay, so that's kind of a, a quick overview. And the point of that was not to overwhelm you, but to show you that for every organ, there's almost something that's a little specific for sickle cell. And so unless your doctor knows what, um, you know, one, it's very important to do the regular treatments that anyone that's age appropriate for any, anybody. But then there are also some other things that we like to add. And one of the, the things we're doing with our treatment um, training and our programs that are coming out is helping other doctors add this to their um, routine so that we're actually helping checking for all these different things that sickle cell can cause to the organs by themselves. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we're building out actually um, flow charts so you don't have to remember all of these yourself or your doctor doesn't too. So hopefully within a few months, we actually will have these out and running. Um, but it's part of the things we're building with this grant from, from the state now. So that when they have sickle cell, we're working with a doctor from Kaiser too, that they actually have like a drop down list. As soon as you come in with sickle cell and you check your kidneys, all the stuff drops down. Have you checked A, B, you know, actually it doesn't even say, have you checked? It says order this, order that, order this. And they pre-order them. And if you've already done it, you can unclick them, but that way they just get done. And we figure if we can start collecting this data automatically, I'm trying to make this as automatic as possible for everybody. So if anything that's adding to anyone's time in a really busy practice, it's really gonna be hard for them to do, even with best of intentions. Because you know, every time we change our computer program or electronic medical record, it just slows you down. So we're trying to automate all of this stuff. So it just knows what to order, excuse me, <clears throat> and then and then when it comes back they can hopefully um either know what to do or give us you know have the have it the way to, uh, with their suggestions they can now click to see what they should be doing or call who to refer to for help so that's kind of where Robert, we're getting with this question sure this in this this uh, this what you this procedure you're talking about now is being dispersed in terms of education um not only just in Oakland, but it's coming to San Francisco hospitals too, right? Yeah, you're actually, you're gonna be a site. And, um, okay. and there's actually, Terry Freelander is over there, he's gonna be the point person at Zuckerberg. And I think Peter Sayer at um, Moffitt. But it's, um, it's a matter of getting these working so that when we release them, they can just drop in and be used. Because we wanna make this as user-friendly <coughs> as possible. Because I can even tell you that I've tried to use drop these, these other things myself and even trying to, it's hard to remember to do them and everything. So we're just trying to use the power of all these electronic medical records, not to make us spend more and more time documenting, but actually speed things up. And that's actually been more challenging than we thought it was gonna be, but that's actually, we think if we can get this out there, then whoever's taking care of folks with sickle cell, this will just come up automatically. And then, then boom, they can just know at least what they should be checking. And hopefully things will, fewer things will slide through the cracks. Gotcha. You know, even if they're not a specialist. Question, I know that we spent a predominant amount of time um, on the African-American community, so to speak, for the uh, you know, sickle cell disease. Right. Um, with, with that said, are you catching more Hispanic Americans 
uh, that may be not necessarily, or how do I say this? So, my, so the dean of tables at General Hospital. Right. And from time to time, on a weekly basis, she gets a, a, a Latino, a, a person of Latin descent right. that comes to her, whether it be a Latin American or an immigrant right. that comes in to ask her about this because things that she's, information that they're reading from pages she has available to them, they're recognizing that this is a symptom that they're feeling. Right. So with that said, are you finding more people in the Mexican and the Hispanic community that are, are, um, that are giving you more data for this as well? We have been, um, I guess, well, first thing I'll say that if someone's there, um, we need, well, we can talk off, we can talk after this is over about, right. there should be some way, because what we do when someone thinks they are having symptoms, we just run their genetics. Right. You know, if they're willing, we just come and pull a tube of blood and just see what they have. Okay. And um, we picked up a couple. We don't have that many people of uh, right. Hispanic descent, but we picked up s several or they've come to us and they've just done a whole lot better when we just get them on hydroxyurea like everybody else. Right. We have people who couldn't get out of the house with pain and they're just like doing great now. But it, okay. so the treatment's not going to be, I mean, if you think about if the underlying disease is about the same, the treatment's not going to be a whole lot of differences. There may be some nuances that we I don't have enough patients to pick up yet, but the basic starts, the basic start. And we, we've just seen several people just do so much better. And they come and told us just how, you know, they feel like they have a new life, you know, because suddenly they, what they thought was normal pains just all went away because they've had them all their lives. We've had people that weren't diagnosed, so they've come here. Because unlike here where everyone's screened for sickle cell at birth, um, they're not in most of places. And so they don't know what, they don't understand these pains, you know, what's oh. going on. That's too. Okay. And on a scale of one to 10 for your perspective with the new procedure that will give you better data implementation, where do you feel like it is in terms of user friendliness for the hospitals? <laughs> well, our plan is about a, I would, I would say about a seven or an eight, which hopefully will be working, but we still have to go through all the different groups to build it in. We've come up with a slick way to maybe just have, I don't want to get into too much of the details, but something we can actually just push out as a Word, Word document that the person can literally cut and paste and put it into their chart and get it to work. And that's where we're trying to go because going through all the other ways to do this has been really challenging. But that's a major focus that a lot of smart people are working, smarter than me and computer stuff are working on right now. So we're hoping this will play out. And that's a really a, a major goal is to get this going because we know how much it's gonna help. All right, so again, not to overwhelm you with all of this, but yes, all the organs have something that we really need to make sure they're paying a little extra attention to to keep people healthy with sickle cell. And a lot of this is preventative care because our whole job is I'd rather you go for all these tests and everything and nothing really being going wrong. But if we pick up something, then we can intervene early and keep things from developing and keep your quality of life um, going up, which we'll talk about again in a little bit. Um, now, briefly, I'm going to talk about um, the doctors um, in the ER because I've worked with them for many years. I, I know um, Ms. Payton's out there who is, I've learned a lot from her about how to talk to people about going to the ER. So she, I'm welcome for her to chime in with anything. But why, can, why are ER visits so challenging and what can help? Um, first thing I wanna say is that there are different, ERs are like anybody else. They're, they all seem to have their own personality and they're all over the board about you know, where, where they are. Um, some people just kind of do the one of the same thing over and over again and just not helping, so they just want to quit. Um, they see the same person over and over again, they give them the same med, and they just don't seem to get any better. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes saying why sickle cell pain is so unique and so challenging, and then we're going to talk about what, what what's the doctors are up against, if they can say it that way. One is sickle cell pain, and I'm, I know I'm you, you can tell me better than I can tell you, but these are some of the things that I've heard. Um, you know, the glass scraping bone was probably the best description I got from a patient one time about how bad and how much it hurts. And I was like, I just stick with me when I'm thinking about, I see patients. I have seen people pass out from sickle cell pain. You know, and so it is not, acute sickle cell pain is just wicked. Um, it obviously is the most common symptom and, and sometimes it's the most absorbing symptom. And I do want to stress that even when you're not having pain and, and you do have sickle cell, things are still going on. That's why the care of the organs is so important. I keep going back to stress that. 
Um, it's the most common reason for hospital admissions and ER visits, about 85%. Interestingly, pain in sickle cell is both undertreated and overtreated, often at the same time. By undertreated, I mean when people are coming in with acute pain, you have to, you know, they're, everything is so activated, you have to help them get ahead of that pain or they're just not, it's gonna take them much longer to heal. That's hard to do sometimes for some doctors, we'll talk about why. And then for chronic pain, which is a different whole pain set, they often get too many opioids that would actually damage the pain nerve and make acute pain trip. It's tough, that's why we need pain specialists. And one of the things we actually have funding in this, um, this money from the state is, is to work with pain docs to really help us improve pain care both short, you know, acute and chronic. There are two different ways to think about pain. There's acute pain and there's chronic pain. And they're, they're, uh, they're um, different, um, they have different causes and different treatments. And yet, having said that, all of us fully understood, understudied. Luckily, things are getting better to studying it. Everyone's getting a lot more interested in this. Um, but some of the things that are there that we know about, this is something from Dr. Balas, I mentioned him before. This was published years ago. You know, all the doctors keep saying, you know, they all get called by ER doctors saying, well, tell me what to measure. Everyone wants something to measure. Well, I wish we had something. Um, I don't know if anyone is a Star Trek fan, but they used to have something on Star Trek called a K-meter, which showed you how much pain somebody was in. I want a K-meter, but we don't have one. But so what we do have is, you know, everyone keeps saying, well, I looked at the hemoglobin. It wasn't low, so they're not in pain. Oh, I looked at the white count. It, it, but the problem is, interestingly, there are things you can measure, but just like how pain is different for everybody, different people, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what changes is different from every people. Um, Samir Ambalas did the best tracking of uh, crises, and this is kind of an average. And I want to point out a couple of things. This is the pain levels um, going up to like a 10 and then down. Notice how long an adult pain crisis tends to last. How many days is that? It's, you know, it can, uh, about 10 days. The, you know, the average pain crisis an adult last about 10 days. It's not three to five like a kid, it's longer. Um, second thing is, notice this right here, this minus one, minus two. This is most folks with sickle cell, and you again, I, you can tell me better than I can tell you, because all my patients can tell me when they think they're, a, a real bad pain crisis is coming because they have some sort of symptoms that they associate with it. One of my um, friends, she, she has nightmares. She wakes up with a certain nightmare. She realizes she's about to have a pain crisis. Some people, their teeth hurt. Well, interesting, a lot of people, their lower part of their tailbone starts to hurt. There's something that's a little signal before it really fires up. And we've always been trying to figure out what we can do to intervene here to really kind of keep this from happening and still poorly understood and studied and not, and it's different from, for different people. But Samir Balaz did, he measured all of these in everybody and he could actually come up with individual pain patterns for different people, but they're all were different. So there's no set of lab values you can get that's universally applicable. But everyone has their own little patterns that they do, which is, um, again, shows you how complicated and how many things are affected by sickle cell. Doctor, I had a quick question before sure. you were on going back to the uh, pain medications. You mentioned the overtreatment. And um, so are, are there any alternatives people are looking at in terms of trying to find a replacement for certain opioids or? Oh, yeah. Um, that's actually an excellent question. I, I, I could spend two hours just talking about that. The problem, <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you the, the basic trouble with opioids. Yeah, yeah, let me, and then they are looking at things and there's a couple things in there that you asked a really good question and I'm gonna give you a short answer that you deserve a longer one. But what we have realized, um, and there's a, been a lot of good work done with this, is that when you actually look in the, you have to, what's funny about sick, of opioids how many people have been on them for years with sickle cell? A lot of people. How long have they actually ever been studied until recently? The longest studies were six weeks. So no one really had any data of what was happening to people six on weeks? opioids for a long time. Kalna Gupta, who was at Wisconsin for a while now, I think she's at Irvine, started looking at this. And the first thing we have to realize is that so many parts of the body have receptors for opioids that have nothing to do with pain. There are receptors on the kidneys, there are receptors on the eyes, blood vessels, there are receptors on the heart. And if you right. take little mice and just give them chronic opioids, that constant stimulation actually gives them symptoms that look like sickle cell symptoms. And they don't have sickle cells, the mice. So it's right. actually doing damage itself um, to, the, to these other organs because of the chronic, chronic use of opioids. 
And then when you look at the pain itself, they've, um, if you've had steady pain and you're on high dose opioids, and this, you know, it's usually over, there's ways you look, try to look at that, and you, you, and you um, don't take your pain medicines, you feel bad. You take them, you don't feel much better. And it's just this kind of, the, the, the pain nerves physically change, you can show, that they don't respond as well, and they've actually changed. And to the point that the pain meds can actually, you know, the morphine can actually cause pain. And so you have this weird dance that's going on in your pain nerve, chronic pain nerve system, that, again, fewer studies in sickle cell patients, but across the board, people with chronic pain correctly defined. Now, we're not talking acute pain. And if you have chronic pain, you can have acute sickle pain on top of it. So there are right. two different things. I'm, I said I'm giving you a short answer. You deserve a longer one. That if you take people with true chronic pain and really get them off their opioids and decrease it, some pa patients' pains actually get better. And most of them don't worsen, but their quality of life goes up because they don't have the side effect from the chronic, chronic opioids that they're on. Doesn't mean they don't have pain. And we're going to talk about that really briefly coming up. So I'm going to jump ahead here. Let me, this is also something to point out. How am I doing on time? Um, if you're having more than three pain episodes a year, acute pain, that's a, to, to our mind, that's a, a marker of active sickle cell. And you're actually, your survival is shorter. At, um, you're, you, if you have more than three pain crisis episodes, at age 40, 60% uh, of people without treatment have died. And so it's a sign of this active disease. So if you're having recurrent acute pain, and again, this is something a clinic uh, sickle cell center would look at, and hopefully a knowledgeable doctor is that, okay, I've got to sort out why this pain's going on. Because if it's really that much and that frequent, I've got to intervene and kind of cool off that sickle cell or it's going to be doing more damage. Um, this is a scary looking slide, but I just want you to look um, at a couple of places. This is work that Tom Coates has been doing. And it's also um, been quite fascinating that um, the, the autonomic nervous system, actually when you're in pain, guess what happens to your blood vessels? You know, people, when they get into a lot of pain, they turn pale. They squeeze down on the blood vessels. And so that kind of slows down how fast blood vessels can go through the capillaries and you get more sickling going on. Right. Well, what's fascinating, and this is all this just to look at here, this is the, the place where it squeezes down when you're in pain. Right. Well, when you have sickle cell, what happens bizarrely is that the thought of having pain squeezes down your blood vessels. In fact, you can actually tell someone, and he, this, this, the studies he did, he put on a heater tip, um, a, a heater probe, so it actually hurts a little bit, and you can measure all that drop. And then if you don't have sickle cell, he puts it on it and says, okay, I'm going to turn it on now. Your body doesn't react until the heater goes on, and you start to really get uncomfortable. If you have sickle cell, as soon as he says, I'm going to turn it on now, your blood vessels squeeze down. So this incredible interaction between anticipatory pain and everything else is another reason it just makes it so complicated, trying to understand how best to handle sickle cell pain, acute sickle cell pain. So quickly here, Wally Smith actually did the best study of what goes on with um, patients with pain. Walking you through it real fast, he did pain diaries that were really well done. 55% 50 of the people had pain 50% of the time, basically. And interestingly, 25% had daily pain from sickle cell. And so it just shows you the pain is there. So even when we're talking about pain treatment, it's not saying you don't have pain. The question is how best to treat it long term to get the most control. And that's a separate question than, oh, I got pain, you know. Um, and so you never um, argue with the patient. And this is the other fascinating thing. Of all the people that had pain, only 3.5% of them go to the ER. And they only go when they're just worn out. It's not like, oh, I turned around, I woke up, I have pain, let me go to the ER. They try to take care of it at home, they try medicine, they try everything else, and when all else fails, they don't go to the ER. They don't want to be in the ER. You don't want to be in the ER. Yeah. And just everything from the weight um, to the doctors, and you know, some people unfortunately are in smaller places that the ER doctors is not that knowledgeable, so we're going to talk about how to handle a visit. <clears throat> now, the first thing, at least in our area, I don't know how it is in San Francisco, we spend a lot of time going out to the ER doctors, talking to them. We actually have patients go out and talk to them, um, trying to really get them to see the, the patient more as a person. And um, even some of our doctors that have been more recalcitrant have actually kind of turned around a little bit, but it's kind of hard. And it's kind of like the 80, 20% of rule. 80% of the doctors, 80, 85, really want to do a good job. There's, a, there's always a small percentage. I guess what, 20% what, of Americans still think the earth is flat. 
that it's just really hard to get much traction with. But that way, if we think we can build in these programs, that'll just be automatic for them. They won't have to do much thinking. But how do ER doctors see their job? If you go to the ER, what's the first thing they're thinking? Do I need to resuscitate this patient? Do I need this life? threatening condition I need to treat. Second thing is, do they need to be admitted? What do I need to set up? And then everything else is other. So the ER doctors, their main things are not to be a clinic, not to, you know, that's the way they, that's why they go into ER medicine, is not to um, be a pain clinic or anything else. They're going, who's coming in with heart attacks? Who's coming in with strokes? Who's coming in with something that needs to be right away? And if they're really sick, let me stabilize them and get them admitted. And that's how they're kind of functioning. And in California with all, you know, we're kind of paying for it now with the COVID um, pandemic, but so many ERs got closed that the average wait in California for all patients was like six hours because there were so fewer ERs, things, more and more things were getting closed down. So that just adds to the trouble. We've tried to put in, and if you actually look at the ASH guidelines, we really want people with um, sickle cell pain to be getting their first dose of medicine within 30 minutes. Um, I can tell you that some ERs have actually tried to do stuff like this, but they just don't have the room. Everything's crowded, and it's, that's been the problem. We've had meetings with sickle cell doctors about sickle cell pain, and interestingly, when they show me the list of people that are coming in with pain, sickle cell pain patients aren't even at the top of the list. They're just getting tons of people with pain, and so you're, in some ways, you're getting swept up with everyone else with pain, from low back to migraines to everything else. So many sickle cell patients are there for pain, and so the ED doctors, unless they have something that's so easy for them to follow, they're gonna be treating all the pains just the same. And they don't have any good way to measure it. We talked about that, the K-meter, so they're not quite sure what to do. So again, some of the issues for the sickle cell patients, even though we have data and the sickle cell, and the, most of the doctors kind of understand that, um, they're still kind of suspicious of people going and, hi, I need four milligrams of Dilaudid every hour for the next three doses. It's, it's like, why? You know, they, they just feel like they're being manipulated by the patient, for good or for bad. Um, and they won't understand you only came there as a last resort. And these are sort of the things that um, we're going to talk about in just a second. And okay. also they want to... Robert, they, I have a question. So they, but, but if the patient has been there to the ED on several occasions, isn't there some sort of history or background that they can refer to so that if the patient walks in and says, I need... Yeah, uh, that this could, and this yeah. something to solidify that because yeah. they're not going to say that unless they know that that's right. what they need to deal with right. their pain. Well, you know the thing is, if, if you if you have a chronic pain condition, you know what helps and how it helps. Right. And and that having a background cuts both ways. If if a, if a, if, a, if, a, if a ER is not too sophisticated and someone keeps coming in, they worry they're just giving the narcotics. And yeah. without any clear goal, because they don't, they think chronic pain is an outpatient treatment. And to a point, it is. If you do find yourself going over and over to the ER for pain, then yeah, that's what you need to talk to your doctor and your, especially your sickle cell specialist about what's driving this and what can we do to help the underlying driver of all this pain versus just going in for the Band-Aid, which is just the acute treatment. Because right. it doesn't help anything. And so at some point, they get more, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to take their side, but you can kind of see. They're taking care of all this stuff and you're here again. You know, so you never want to hear that from your doctor. You're here again. That it's, um, you know, they're just giving you more meds to see what's, you know, going on. And they know you're going to be back and they're like scratching their head. What can we do here? Um, okay. Because they know they're not really treating the underlying condition. Okay. So they, they if the patient comes in uh, on a regular doctor visit, uh, uh, the doctor, uh, the physician has that background that they've been in X amount of times right before their actual appointment in the, in, the, in, in the office, right? I mean, do they get that information? So if I've gone to the emergency five times and then I see my primary care physician on uh, uh, two weeks later, doesn't that, my, my, my PCP have that information that I've been in five yeah. times already so that we need to? One would hope. Um, the reason uh, I say that is that all the ER, everyone that put out these electronic medical records they all don't talk to each other. Uh, and that's the big, big problem. Right. And that's something we're really trying to work on. Um, and that's what so I was talking about having those um, care plans go out because this ER, this electronic medical record won't pull it in from somewhere else. And so that's a real question. They're getting better at that, but not yet. 
And this is again one of the things that you know, if you find yourself going in on your own checklist, going, "Geez, I've gone to the ER four times in the last two months. Maybe you know, let me call and see what's you know, maybe I need more aggressive underlying sickle cell treatment." And that's what we're going to talk about shortly. Okay. Um, so again, this is uh, again, I a lot of this is from Ms. Peyton. But again, one thing that can help most doctors, though we've still had a few that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always intriguing to me for an ER doctor somewhere to be telling me that they, they know sickle cell and, you know, a lot more better than I do. And it's like, who are you? Um, and that, you know, people, it's true. It, it's all the time. And it's like, but if you actually have, they just want to, most doctors want to do the right thing. So if you actually come with, a pain plan, and we're trying to figure again how to put these on electronic medical records. Dr. Gorilla tried to do smart cards. Again, we wanted something automatic, and that's actually been tr been hard to do. So it just pops up. This is the pain plan. If you have a question, this is who to call. And because if you can give someone somewhere to start and a backup, they can call to verify. I occasionally get calls from outlying ERs that says, "Did you write this?" And I look at it. Yep. They go, "Fine, thanks," and they're done. And they'll follow the plan after that. Um, because the doses are higher than they're used to giving, the frequency can be higher, and sometimes the just the whole connection can be a little bit more challenging for them. And they usually, if they believe this, you know, they're really happy to have something they can follow and someone they can call if they have a question. Okay, so that makes their job so much easier. So that's one clear thing. If you go to the ER more than once every couple of years, and maybe even then, you need to have your, talk to your doctor about having a pain plan written out. And the other thing that helps me about these pain plans is that after we've used them a couple of times, I asked the, the person what was working, what was not working. Were you able to get ahead of your pain? Were you able to avoid admission? Was it enough? And then we can adjust it based on some real individual personalized data versus, oh, here's a generalized thing I got out of a journal about general sickle cell care. And so we actually can tune it up that way, what meds worked better, what didn't. And after a while, we have this kind of really personalized pain plan that seems to help most people. Um, as um, Ms. Williams has said, and also the phone can help, take a friend with you. You know, you're in pain, you've been sick, you're exhausted, you can't sleep, you can't be at your best. And that's why it's really important to have someone, who, again, who knows you can, can, can help advocate with you that, you know, this is what's going on and this is, you're, they're here to really help kind of watch to see how they're, how they're doing with their meds, to see how, how they can help both sides. Um, you know, you're lucky enough um, and if, 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 if you can take somebody with you. And again, having the journal and all is also important to kind of keep track of your experiences. Because a lot of times people will come and tell me they had a bad experience. I say, well, who was the doc and what hospital? They kind of remember the hospital, but they can't quite remember what happened. And so, and it's hard even when you're not feeling well, because all you want to do is get some relief. And it's hard to get that going. And also, this is something so important too. Let the doc or the nurse know that this is not your typical sickle cell pain. That's probably the biggest red flag something else is going on that you don't want to miss. You know, everyone that has recurrent pains has a pretty good idea of what they are. But let's say your pains are usually your back and lower legs and knees, and suddenly you come in and your chest is telling you, tell them that's not normal for your pain. Because that's at that point they need to do a lot more investigation than just to perhaps give you um, some, some medicine and have you sit in the back of the, um, the ER for a couple hours. Because that something, if it's different, it's different and needs to be looked at. Almost all life-threatening events start with pain, and then they evolve into something else pretty quickly. So if it's not your typical pain, let the doctor know. All um, right. Dr. Hager, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, my name is Nina, um, and I just wanted to ask, like, what do you think is the most effective way for patients to communicate with a new provider like they've never seen them before mm -hmm. about like their sickle cell condition right. because like you mentioned earlier the transition from peds to adult care is really tough and especially when the e they're in the er and they don't really have that relationship with that doctor like what do you recommend oh i'm gonna answer that on three levels one our transition patients we've actually had as not as often as we should but we actually take tours of er's with the younger patients and have them just kind of walk through and meet the, you know, we can't do it now with the COVID stuff. But actually say these, you know, we're getting ready to transition, these are the doctors. We usually, we obviously let the ER docs know there and they usually have the ER director there. And that way you can see them when they're upright and they're, you know, normal and not in pain. And they actually see them as people more. These are, you know, coming, uh, coming through. 
The second is if they're just having to go somewhere, that's why we actually like people to have a letter that has our clinic name on it, our contact information on it. And you know, if you have any questions, call. And then if you it's a new person, you know, you you have to unfortunately be an advocate for your own disease because hi, you know, I've I guess you know, when you have sickle cell, I don't know how many patients you've treated, but this is my pain plan that was developed by my center. And if you have questions, give them a call and I can answer any questions, you know. You know, this is the usual it takes about this to, to help them, you know, get things going. Um, and, but it's hard to do. And that's why a friend can be very helpful, too. Because when you're just in a lot of pain, it's hard to be at your best. And they can help um, and take that off. And then what we try to do with our patients, this is the, the last level, is we kind of uh, keep track of who's having trouble where. And at that point, we can not kind of know where to kind of call the ER director or even the docs themselves. Because usually... Even when we actually get the doctor there, they're actually doing, what's the word I'm looking for? Most doctors do want to do a good job, but they could be having a, a day where just everything's going to heck in a handbasket with all these other patients too. So it's kind of hard to kind of put all that together on a, you know, a visit or so. But this is it's, um, why it's important to kind of keep, keep track with that. And again, why it's good to have a friend um, they are going to be those doctors, and I've run into them too, that just feel like they know everything they want to do. And at that point, that's kind of where you may not, just, <laughs> that's what we're going to get to that. Um, you know, just introduce yourself, you know, say I have pain, you know, I'm, you know, I've had pain for four days, and I just can't manage it at home anymore. You know, here's the usual, what usually helps me get, stay out of the hospital, and, um, you know, here's what you can call with questions. And that usually does, goes a long way with most doctors. So that way someone's not just rolling in and, you know, they're just kind of, because even doctors who want to do well, they worry about the doses. You know, if someone says, you know, let me, and I hear this a lot from patients who don't have a pain plan or didn't bring one with them or they won't call us. They give them like half a milligram more, you know, a lot. So I'll check you in, in two hours and say, that's not going to do anything, you know, unless you're absolutely opioid naive. And let me say one other thing real quick. I just, I just thought about it. I didn't put it on here. There have been, and I have been aware of, even in this area, several patients who have died from getting too much dilated in an ER in, area, in sickle cell. And there were the patients with sickle cell that almost never used narcotics. They went in and they said, oh, I got sickle cell, give them four milligrams. And they give them four milligrams and not monitoring. That would stop my breathing. So if you're not opioid tolerant, nice. it's really different. That's why a lot of ER doctors are just so careful. So that's why having a plan because these are my normal doses goes so far to helping getting to a dose fast enough that actually will help. Because unless they know you really well or have something built in, it's kind of scary for them. And they all know, you know, they almost would rather err on that side, but again, that's kind of hitting that balance. So that's why pain plans are so important and we're trying to figure out how to automate those too, but we've really had trouble with that one. Because the, as um, Ms. Brock said, the, the ER system, the um, records don't talk to each other. Okay, we're running. Hey, Doctor yes. Hager. Yeah, this, this is Pat Corley, and I've I've actually been a sickle cell nurse for over forty years. I you have been, I know. And um, you know, this is a recurring problem and issue all the time, and and I think part of it is that 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 we haven't done our job well. So so we ha actually have a responsibility to educate those emergency room physicians and staff where they better understand sickle cell disease and they understand what people with sickle cell disease go through. I think that us just saying that patients should go uh, and they should give them all this information is, is really not going to resolve what they're going through. What's the only way that it's going to be resolved is that we do a better job of what we need to do in terms of educating and being forceful about um, supporting our patients as they go into those emergency room settings and saying to them, you know, we've, looked, we've had a Pisces study. We had Dr. Ballas who did a study and we have shown that less than 1% of our population has a problem with uh, opioids. And so uh, when they come into the emergency room, they're gonna come in Hopefully, they're taking information with them. Hopefully, the doctors will take time to review that information. And hopefully, we will have formulated um, pain plans for all of our patients. But until we get on our job and do it better than what we've been doing it um, um, on, a, on a national basis, our patients are going to continue to have these problems. And, 
and it may come down even to legislative stuff or uh, legal um, uh, interventions that cause doctors to look differently at the way they treat people with sickle cell disease because it's the only condition that people were born into pain and they're going to have pain until we figure out some way of preventing that from happening. Hey, uh, really quickly, um, I wanted to introduce uh, uh, Pastor Timothy Dews. Would you mind reflecting a little bit on the situation? I just saw a message from you in the group chat in regards to what Pat Corley's talking about. Do you do you do you care? Do you uh, feel uh, comfortable expressing that to us, Pastor? You're on. I, un I unmuted him, but I don't know if he's speaking. Okay. Oh, he can only hear. He only has. He only can hear. Oh, listen mode. That's right. That's what they did text me and said that they only had listening mode. Gotcha. Okay. 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 Um. So then, uh, with uh, Robert and Pat, uh, just really quickly, um, Nina, uh, is one of the one of the associates that's joining our organization. Um, she's in the works of, uh, like, constructing a possible advocacy kit. Um, do you guys think that that would be something that is could be useful? You know, I, I really don't think it's a problem with people advocating for themselves. It's a problem with people receiving, you know, the right reaction to their advocacy uh, in regards to their sickle cell disease. So I don't know that the kit will be beneficial. You know, I, I always think it's important for patients to carry their portfolio of their information so that they can present that. But unless people are willing to, you know, to utilize that, that's not going to make a difference for them. And, and you know, I see well-educated patients going to the emergency room have the same problem yeah. as patients who yeah. aren't good at advocating for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure that's the answer. I think it's a lack of knowledge you know, to a point that it makes people not really know um, the magnitude of sickle cell disease. And I think that we have to do our job better in terms of educating and being there to support them as they're, you know, they're engaged um, with, with people with sickle cell disease. Yeah, if I may add, some of my um, friends who are doctors have the same, with sickle cell, have the same trouble when they go in with certain people. They just, you know, the, the same... And going back to what Pat said, it was so important. The people that are the pressure points and the people we work on that have seemed to have made the most change is actually to get the, um, first the hospital uh, CEO involved, that this is important, and then the ER director. And actually at that point, then you kind of have this whole culture down thing going on. It's actually more challenging to work with the ER doctors because they work on so many different shifts. That even when we try training, we've had a few come over for training, but they're all either doing nights for two weeks or day, or all the different ways they do their strain shifts. It's hard to find much time to pitch more than a couple at a time. But Dr. Hager, if it's coming from, from the CEO and the administrator of the hospital, and it has ramifications for, you know, um, for, for um, performance, Right. you know, evaluations and stuff, then the, that's the way that you really impact folk, you know, right. they, they have to know what you're, what you expect of them, you know, and so we really, and, that, and what you're talking about, the CEO, Adrian and I have talked about that over and over again, and, and, and that's always our plan of action is to meet with the CEO and stress the important, teaching them what sickle cell disease, because if, if you're high up at the hospital, know what sickle cell disease is, then it can filter down. Right. You know, and it doesn't filter down unless you impact those on the top, you know, where it's a trickle down kind of thing right. and it goes to all the areas. And then you can hold people um, responsible, you know, for their actions. And one of the things I mean, that I just want to interject something here very quickly, only because higher, higher, higher. OK, uh, I just want to interject the fact because uh, um, Dr. Hager said something about the ER doctors seeing them as, as whole people, as, as, as a person. Um, that's the, the, the real and the main focus of the advocacy and empowerment program, that if we could get the medical professionals in a different environment whereby they see the patients outside of the hospital, they can begin to develop a different perception about the people 
that they're dealing with once they come into the hospital. That's the key to this whole program. It's just to try to bridge that so that they stop looking at the pain when they walk in and think that they're drug seekers and that they're this and they're that. Look at the whole person and recognize that they don't really want to be there, but this is their last resort. And that's really unfortunate. Yeah. However, yeah. since I'm in this environment, can you just please help me and understand what I'm saying? And that's when the whole other element of effective listening comes in. Because now you're not right. depending on all that you have learned but you are starting to try to learn and understand the patient that you're dealing with at the time and what they need in order to expedite them to get out of the hospital. They don't want to be there. And you know that, uh, Dr. Ward, Dr. Yep. Uh, Dr. Hanger. So I just want to reiterate, uh, I, I, I really hope that everybody finds the value of this program because that's yeah. what it really right. is right. about. So it's trying to just get everybody to change the perceptions about how you see me and how you treat me. And that way we can eliminate the misunderstandings, the mistreatment and the misdiagnosis. So I just wanted to share that. Thank so, you. So, 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 so again, I'm gonna chime in and say that we have to change the view from the top. And so we all know that there's in institutional biases going on, you know, and that, that there are, um, preconceived ideas about sickle cell disease and until we educate those CEOs and those people at the top where they insist that their their people below them act in a certain way people with sickle cell disease are going to continue to go through what they go through and Coretta um, mm -hmm. Degenerate and a lot of other folks who who do a lot of work with people with sickle cell disease um, have already, you know, they've already written papers and demonstrated all this stuff. And so I think we have to put into action, we have a responsibility as providers to put into action plans that can make a difference for people with sickle cell disease. And so, so I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna respectfully um, say that I think we're, we've been doing the best that we thought we could do, but we can do better because we're gonna have to really impact systems now. Yeah, agree. So um, just really quickly, Robert, um, normally around this time, um, we, you have given, you as well as some of our other presenters have given such a great presentation that all the ideas and questions start to fly. Uh, so we like to try to do our best to give ourselves a chance for about 30 minutes for the Q&A, just because we do have some scenarios that might take us a little longer. Uh, do you have anything else of the presentation you wanted to get off before we start the Q&A, sir? Um, just kind of following up on <clears throat> what Pat um, was saying, and, and okay. um, Ms. Proc, uh, and, and, uh, is that trying to see people as um, people. That's why we try to take the transitioning um, uh, young people out there so they can see them when they're feeling well. We actually encourage what we had before COVID, our, our, our patients to go out there and just talk to the docs if they, you know, that took care of them, go back and they did a good job, go back and thank them when they're feeling good. It's amazing how much that makes them more seen as a person than just uh, the pain and so on in bed three. And, and going back to about changing the view from the top and something that goes to their uh, report, if someone comes in and said they weren't really feeling like they get a, um, were doing well, we actually help them write a, a letter stating why their, their needs weren't met and send it to the CEO because that's what they collect and they have to look at those things as opposed to just going and never is going to change and nothing's going to happen. And then they often ask us for us to you know, help work with the ER doctors. Well, we're not perfect, but we do moderately well for most of our visits around here. And again, we have no trouble sitting down with um, particular ER staff that seem to be having trouble with patients, but we always make sure the, the patient's there because that again humanizes them. You know, I'm having trouble here when I'm coming in with pain. What do I need? We just had one with, um, I'll, Alta Bates Hospital with a person who's having a lot of trouble and seems to have gotten a lot better. So let's, we're hoping it holds, but things are always changing. And I guess really quickly, um, the, the new treatments that are out there, um, over the last, hydroxyurea is still the mainstay drug. It's the best drug if you have SS, you should be on it unless there's a reason not to. You can add to it. L-glutamine, uh, transfusions, transplants, or genetic therapy, and a couple other drugs that are just brand new here too. These were approved, notice the dates, November last year. Um, Oxbrida from GBT, 
and a deck video um, from uh, Novartis now. Uh, it's, and these are the number of patients that were in the pivotal trials that were on it. And just really quickly, they do seem to be, I want to drag, drag you through this. This is kind of cool for the GBT product. What we know it does, it raises your hemoglobin and does it within weeks. This is your hemoglobin level on the dose. This is the dose they're using. Within two to four weeks, you can go up a gram, a gram and a half. And they've had a few patients go up three grams. Um, so that's been pretty good um, for that. We, it does not seem to increase pain on their, the study that they did for 24 weeks. Um, remember, as I said, most things that raise hemoglobin except hydroxyurea cause pain. We were really happy this did not seem to increase it. Now, whether it decreases it, we're finding out later. What the um, uh, ADECVIO does, it blocks the, um, the cells from attaching to the red cell lining. And this is kind of where we are with it here, really quickly. What we, what we know about with the new medications, these are hydroxyurea, L-glutamine. Um, this is ADECVIO, that's a chemical name. And this is the GBT product. Um, what do we know do about um, reducing pain? Well, we know hydroxyurea is the most active. And then um, adecvio seems to be too. So if you're having on hydroxyurea with SS and still having a lot of pain, this would be a good one to ask your doctor to try. Um, if you're still having symptomatic anemia, <clears throat> having a transfused and iron overloaded, um, we are putting a lot of people on um, oxbrider just to increase their hemoglobin to see if they feel better, uh, just from having a higher hemoglobin. And then, so there are ways that we can mix and match these now. And that's the whole point is now, we're, we used to be a one trick pony with hydroxyurea, but now we're having other things. And where all these question marks are, there are ongoing trials trying to fill in the gaps about how this is gonna help. So that's kind of cool. So the first time we really have more than one or two things we can, can use. So I just wanna put that out there. So hopefully in an, about a year, we're gonna have a completely different approach to a lot of these things. So that's it. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and speaking of that, just really quickly, um, um, Ted, are you still on? Yes, I'm here. Um, would you have any more updates outside of what Robert said in terms of a voxelator? Voxelator? No, and you know, I'm really here to listen and learn. I, I cool. would say that um, um, people can go to our company website and read a lot about our drug. Nice. The, the the publication in the New England Journal showed that the pain was actually going down, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So we can't claim that, but the trend was going in the positive direction. And really the intent of our drug is to try to disease modify early so that as you get older, you don't develop the progressive problems. And I want to say that we are very excited about this drug because this mechanism of action is so far upstream and maybe preventing so many of those things, those complicated stuff I was showing you happening downstream from happening. And even though, and, and um, Dr. Love was right, the pain was just starting to separate. But again, it's, it wasn't separating enough that we know it was more than chance. But importantly, it wasn't hopping up. Because so many other things we've studied that increase hemoglobin, the pain just shot up. So if we can protect organs, even if we can't necessarily decrease a lot of pain, it's still gonna be a very important drug. But we're hoping that it'll help pain in the long term too as things cool off and heal up. But yeah, those studies are ongoing and there are more coming that I know about, but we'll see. Dr. Dr. Hickard, I have a question. Uh, those, those new therapies that you talked about, are they affordable and available to patients? Um, <laughs> uh, the short answer is right now we're, getting most things approved. We're getting some pushback because they are expensive, but we have both of them available and have patients on them. Um, so for right now, the, the answer is um, yes. And I think as long as you know the data comes going in, still showing they're safe and effective and there's not any un unexpected um, problems going forward because these are new drugs, then they probably will be because it's a fairly interesting, um, cost-effective calculation. I, I'm actually on the um, National Institutes of Health um, Committee that's working with um, economists is actually modeling the cost of these drugs and the cost savings of using them, not using them. And within about a year, we're going to actually have a really good idea about, uh, about this. But the back of the envelope thing, if you actually have decreased end organ damage and pain in ER visits, um, it's pretty cost-effective. 
but we have you know that's what's coming up but right now yes we're, we're having to justify mm -hmm. each patient and okay Hi. can i add something because i know the company has a lot to do with some of these issues yeah. uh so uh nadina if you don't have insurance gbt gives you free drug so our commitment has been nobody uh will not get this drug because they can't afford it if you have medic medicaid which many sickle cell patients have about half in the US. There is a copay. That copay in most states is zero. Um, in some states, it's up to eight or ten dollars per month. And so the drug is readily available. And if you have commercial insurance, we will pay your copay for you. The company will. So the drug should be very affordable to the patient. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, and, so and, much, Dr. I, I, Dr. Hager. Can you share that the other drugs also have compassionate um, programs? I don't know if they do. Consider. I, I I wish I could. I, I don't know if they do. And I, it, as Dr. Love was saying, if if the the, the one trouble we've had with um, GBT approval is by private insurances is that for some reason they want everyone to have been tried and failed hydroxyurea and we keep pointing yeah. out that's not how it goes. So we've actually had some trouble with private insurances not approving the drug, but we've been fairly successful eventually getting it through. So we've been working hard with this and GBT has some help for people that are trying to get through private insurances also. And that's gonna get much better, Dr. Hager. When a new drug comes out, these plans, Medicaid and commercial, they go through a review process to get the drug on their approved formulary list. And it takes about six to nine months to do that. And as you know, Oxbrida was just approved uh, at the end of November. November. So we're still in the middle of it. Actually, it's going extremely well. And we expect by the end of the year, mm -hmm. almost everybody in the US will be covered. And you should not be going through that process. That's it's right. Um, the average time between a doctor asking for the drug and the drug being delivered is already down to about 20 days in the United States. Right. And it's going to continue to come down to several days, we hope. I guess we can't comment on We had a question from Jose. Jose, would you like to ask a question, sir? Yes, I, I have a question regarding that new uh, drug to treat the, um, the bo bo boxellator. Regarding, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because normally I would have to have transfusions these days uh, because my blood count just drops quite a bit. Okay. And my question is, will this drug help with my situation? I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. I, um, actually, this is probably one of the best uses right now uh, because we, what we do know for sure about the drug is that for most patients, it raises the hemoglobin at least about a gram. Mm -hmm. And so if if we can, we have several patients in our day hospital who are getting transfused for symptomatic anemia, or they're just so low, we've, we're starting to put them on Oxprida and increasing their hemoglobin so they either don't need blood or they need a whole lot less blood. Right. That protects them from iron overload. And now we're obviously trying to track too to make sure that their symptoms are improving too. And so we're kind of, um, as Dr. Love was saying, this is a new drug, so we don't have all the information, but we do see this as a major use for this uh, medication. There's people on regular transfusions because of low counts kind of bring that up to either hopefully get them off transfusions or really reduce their exposure to blood. Thank you. Hey, Robert, we have yeah. a question. Um, we have a question really quickly. Uh, this is from Gloria Stanley and Timothy Dews. Um, they wanted to know more about, they wanted to say, the, the question is, can you explain infarction as it relates to sickle cell? What can or should be done when you have an infarction? How can you prevent it to be prevented or is it a minor issue? Well, yes and no. How about that for an answer? The <laughs> infarction, all infarction means is there a tissue has died for lack of oxygen. So a cardiac infarction, a heart attack means part of the heart has died from lack of oxygen. And folks without sickle cell that have heart attacks, they usually just have a big cholesterol plaque that ruptures and plugs off the blood flow to a part of the heart muscle and it can't get oxygen, so it dies. That is an infarction. So anything that's dying from lack of oxygen is technically an infarction. So 
In sickle cell, we talk about bone infarctions, skin, you know, rib infarctions, muscle infarctions. It just means the sickling process has gotten to the point that there's just been no flow to an area long enough for the tissue to die. And that's what we're looking at for some of these um, agents to kind of keep the sickling down, all those other complex stuff I showed you. I didn't get, not to overwhelm you with it, but all these things that are happening so that the blood will keep flowing so you won't have an infarction. Now, if you have a tiny infarction, and in fact, those little silent infarcts, there's little tiny infarctions in the brain, some of those um, probably aren't going to really impact anything, and, and a big one would. Um, but if you get a whole bunch of little ones, they can add up too. So one of the things is our imaging is getting better is we're starting to track more quantitatively what's going on with these. So she, uh, that question is a very important one, but it's a very broad one at the same time. So if you're talking about an infarction to like a bone, they often heal up pretty well. But if you're talking about an infarction to a brain, it's probably not coming back. So it's in a matter of where it's happening. And all of that relates to you know, the sickling process getting going. So anything that interferes with the activity of sickle cell disease is going to help prevent that. And maybe the um, products like um, the Adecbio, which kind of keeps things from sticking, may help. We don't know that yet. And hopefully the GBT product, as the hemoglobin's up higher, and they won't sickle as much, will keep all those downstream things from happening, and then may help protect things. Those studies, probably in a year or so, we're going to have a lot more information on exactly how to use these um, very exciting agents. So, so Dr. Hager, can you talk about, um, you talked about bone infarct a, a little bit. Um, but I think a lot of the patients probably would like to know a little bit more about bone infarct because that one of the things I need you to talk about is the length of, 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 of pain related to bone infarcts as opposed to just the a complicated sickle cell painful event um, and, and what kind of treatment they should do if they have bone infarcts. I know that we at LAC USC used to sometimes do nerve blocks and stuff. So yeah. if you can talk a little bit about those kind of things um, in re relationship to um, bone infarcts. Yeah, sadly, anything can infarct. You know, we mentioned before with acute chest, 10% of it's actually bone marrow infarcts that have broken loose and gone to the lung. Bone themselves, bones are living tissue, but they're tiny blood vessels encased in this basically calcium shell. And so when they infarct, they tend to be a little more um, persistent. Now there's a little difference between bone infarcts, like if you look at an x-ray and just see what looks like chalk lines on, your, on the x-ray where they, the bone's kind of scarred down, and what we call a vascular necrosis, which is infarction of the weight-bearing part, usually of the hips and the shoulders. Um, they actually are a little different in how they behave. But the question is, yeah, if you get a bone infarct, it's usually a deep aching pain that kind of persists in one area. It doesn't move around a lot. And they can last a good four to six weeks. If they're in the um, weight-bearing area, you have to be a lot more careful about it. And that's where you want to get off of that. And that's where crutches are often sometimes used, even with otherwise healthy pe people, to take the pressure off so it can heal up. If the pain is not controllable, um, we do try a bunch of things, um, like local injections trying to get to deaden the nerves to that area so you're just not in so much um, pain. Um, the avascular necrosis, which you hear about, which is actually a type of bone infarct in the weight-bearing area of the hip, hip, the heads of the hip and the shoulders, that's actually a very uh, important area to keep looking at. And one of the things we do in clinics is we're always checking people's bones and their range of motion to make sure they're not tightening up or they're having any pain. Or if someone has actually had severe pain in their hips or their shoulders, we try to get them for MRIs to look not only at the bones, but actually at the tendons and the ligaments and the cartilage there, because there's a, a lot of infarcts can happen and, and heal up. But bone, bone pain is obviously, when you think about it, it's a really deep and challenging pain. And we often use uh, orthopedists or orth consultants to try to inject those areas to deaden them out. We also important to know that even if you have sickle cell and have bad pain in the hip, you, it's important to make sure you have a good evaluation because we have some folks who have horrible avascular necrosis of their shoulders and their hips, and yet their pain is coming from good old tendonitis and a little local injection just takes the pain away for three months. So even though you have changes on x-ray, you need a good exam by a knowledgeable provider or orthopedist to actually figure out where the pain is coming from to see if there's something you can't, you can enter, 
um, intervene with to actually improve your quality of life. Got it. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Hendricks, uh, Wanda has a question. Wanda? Wanda? She had her hand up. Wanda. You may have muted yourself, Wanda. Wanda? Okay. We'll come back to her. I do. Uh, have Tyree, Tyree, would you like to ask your question or would you want me to ask your question? I feel more comfortable with uh, with you asking, please. Okay, so um, the question we have here, uh, Robert, is <clears throat> what should patients with sickle cell do if coming in contact with laricidic infection during the pandemic? Is it what, dangerous I'm and how sorry. dangerous is it? With what kind of infection? Laricidic infection? Paras parasitic. A oh, parasitic. Parasitic, parasitic, my bad. It would depend on the parasite. That's the, you know, if it's just flea bites, it's one thing, you know, this, they're annoying, but they're not a trouble, but if it's something that actually gets inside you, then that's a whole different, different question. I'm guessing right. from most people's parasitic stuff is gonna be stuff running around their house, often brought in by pets, um, cause that's where most parasitic infections kind of come from. Luckily in this country, we don't have too many internal parasites, but I guess that'd be possible too. I guess in and of itself, the it wouldn't be necessarily more dangerous, but if it kept you from getting evaluated and the care you need, then that may be how that would be an issue if you're just not gonna go in or see or see someone. Or let me flip it around because a lot of places are closed. You can't get in to see uh, a dermatologist and you're kind of wrestling with what's, what it could or couldn't be. Um, gotcha. The good, the set, most parasitic infections in this country are a nuisance problem, but there are two, a few that usually going to have fevers, diarrhea, or you know belly pain if it's going to be more severe. So most likely it's a a skin trouble, which is still bad enough, but it's not necessarily going to be a life threat. Long term health. So so Robert, real quick, if so, let's let's take this scenario. Let's take this scenario. Your hemoglobin drops twice within three months to a five or lower, and you've never experienced that before. Is that something other than sickle cell? Well, excellent question. I like that. The, the, the way we would do that, if someone dropped in, um, they dropped the first time, they dropped the second time, we try to pull them in right then and look at all the other markers for hemolysis. Because you can actually measure how, if the cells are falling apart, and the most important thing for for blood work is just look at the smear because you can often tell by looking at that what's going on you can see the cells that are falling apart see what's going on count how many sickle cells they are there are things in the blood that go up called ldh and everything and if they're really getting high then that probably is active sickle cell for whatever reason one of those complicated pathways i showed you is getting more active and trapping more cells and causing them to break down and at that point we would try to um, um, match that up with what symptoms that you're having if you're just noticing, huh, I'm getting more yellow and I check my counts and they're lower, no, we probably would just watch you closely and see if you um, were coming up. If you had any other symptoms, then we'd try to figure out what's driving your sickle cell. Well, what, if, what, if the, what if the symptoms vary from um, headaches, um, joint, joint and pain, you know, in, in the shoulders and in the legs, um, stomach aches? you know, something like that and, and possible, yeah, possible fevers. I mean, I don't know if it, if, if I've had an actual fever fever, but I know, I noticed my temperature, you know, it'll But then you, up. then we'd be, you know, things like that are happening. You wonder about how active your sickle cells cranking up. And when I say it that way, it's important to know any infection or inflammation can drive your sickle cell. You know, it, it can, it can get all those other processes going and just crank up your sickle cell. So, you know, wonder, you know, you worry that, you know, if you're having any sinus trouble that's causing this to be um, more of a fever, we try to, you know, look along down. With that, along with that too, uh, yeah, what would be pushing your sickle cell to get up? Because if we actually measured you and your, say your LDH is shooting up and your cells are falling apart, you know, and so we got to figure out what's pushing that. Sometimes some people with bad sinuses will go into crises recurrently because the inflammation from the sinusitis will just get all the blood vessels activated. Um, and, the, and the white counts will go up. Because sickle cell is an inflammatory condition. The white counts are high. And one of the main reasons hydroxyurea is so effective for many people with SS 
is it pushes your white count down. So you don't get all this activation through the body that causes this stuff to happen. Um, which is also one of the toxicities that pushes it too low, but that's why we monitor. But yeah, and then it's interesting when we follow people, they'll go through a, a period where things are happening and then it can settle out, but we'd really try to match your symptoms to your lab values and then try to figure out how the best way to, to intervene to, um, to handle the most um, challenging symptoms and make sure we're not overlooking any long-term other diseases or infections. Hey, Robert. Yeah. So I, this is a question for a good number of people that are um, in the chat. Um, and it, it goes back to you and I, our first introduction of each other at um, General Hospital in San Francisco mm -hmm. for when we were both at the conference for hematology and oncology. And right. I'm kind of going back to the portion of education. So Sickle Cell Enemy Awareness to San Francisco, the nonprofit that's putting forth this AP, we are developing an outreach program to where we want to try to find a way to make a print on the education system about adding more sickle cell uh, informative education into their understanding, uh, whether it be uh, 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 post-grad or under, uh, uh, what is, the, I forgot the other term that when you're in the first four, it just escapes my mind. But the question is, is, you know, Terry talked a lot about having trouble finding hematologists Right. and so forth my question to you in that case because we do have some we do have some interns here that are med students that are currently going to post-grad where do you see that disconnect for the for the, the interest to be as a be a hematologist or be in this arena and how do you feel like we could actually um try to create more outreach to interest these 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 students to join this this arena of, of, of med, medical profession? Um, you want the sad answer? <laughs> <laughs> Give me the truth. Money. Money? Got it. Yeah, because if you actually go into cancer care, you make a ton of money. Hematology yeah. by itself makes nothing. Years yeah. ago, this came up, and I was actually talking to the Social Security Administration. They were trying to get uh, more people qualified for um, social security benefits. And they were asking, what can we do to get more people to see sickle cell patients? And I said, pay them more, give them a hundred bucks per patient. They'll be fighting each other to give good service. And they go, oh no, right. we don't want to pay more money. We're going to pay them less. But how do we get them to, <laughs> so well, and it's not so much that they just want money per se. It's a, unless you have the resource, I guess it's a, it's a market for resources. We can do what we do because we have social workers involved, we have consultants we can use. They're folks with sickle cell, as you know yourselves, they can be extremely complicated and most doctors just don't have the resources to figure out how to put all those pieces together. Got so it. that's part of the issue that we're trying to figure out how to build out with these networks to give them support so they can see more. There's been a big thrust in kind of giving up on the hematologist actually and yeah. trying to, have to train more um, primary care doctors. Just to see patients and be able to do right. more of the, you know, because probably a good 80% are nuts and bolts thing. If you know what you're doing, you can get it done. And then the 20% are more complicated. Refer those to centers. Maybe the best model we're looking at. There are some hematologists that are really interested in sickle cell um, and they tend to want to do research. And yeah. that's a different critter in the sense that you'd have to go, you know, you go through training and research training. And then you're living on grants basically like we do. Um, right. You're not really, you know, we're not making money on sickle cell, shall we say. Not gotcha. that we're trying to, but it's not, you know, it's, it's just the way the structure is. And that's kind of the sad thing. And even we've had some hematologists and other doctors wanting to see patients, but they can only take a couple because they can take so much of the resources to do this. They really can't get everything together that you really need to do to kind of carry this forward. And that's kind of a structural issue that we've, Again, it's over my um, head to understanding yeah. why it's so hard to fix that. And Dr. Carrillo, I don't know if he's still on, but he went through a couple of years lobbying, helping lobbying, and almost got this thing through where if you have, a, by definition, a rare disease is less than 200,000 people. So sickle cell in this country is a rare disease. And all he wanted to do was say, if you have a rare disease, you can pick which silo you're in. So people could change their insurance to here. It would be the same amount coming from the states or the whatever. But that got fought tooth and nail by the counties that didn't want to lose people off the registry because they get paid by how many numbers are on there. 
So there's all these little things that are popping around out there that just make it, you know, we scratch our heads over why it sounds like something should be easy, but it just really hasn't been. And they can't um, make it mandatory because oncology and hematology run together. Can't they make it mandatory for them to be uh, as well versed in oncology as they are in hematology? I mean, well, well versed. In the pro you, you, you asked an, an important question, and yes, there are board questions on there, but it doesn't say how they're going to practice when they get out. Yeah, okay. yeah, and that's part of it. We will say that a lot of our uh, fellows come here because of our hematology and because of our sickle cell, um, but there are people who just have different interests. You know, they have people who since, you know, undergraduate have been doing research in leukemia or brain tumors, and they're just not going to have, even though they will see some sickle cell patients. And again, since it's a rare disease, areas have different pockets. You can go to somewhere that's really good in uh, hematology and oncology and not see one or, the one or two sickle cell patients for years. Because yeah. it's just not, you know, it's not the volume to, to see. Gotcha. And so it's an intriguingly that, challenging question. Uh, that other thing that you made about uh, more money, I heard that as well. There's not a lot of money. And I, let me flip that around. I, that was a, I don't want to just sound flippant. I'm, no. People to have resources to take care, you know, yeah. They really to get in and realize, oh my gosh, we have a lot of psychosocial dynamics here. We have these things we really need to help with this follow up. How, you know, where can we get some help to do this? Because they, um, most offices just don't have, are not set up for that. So every time the poor patient comes in, they're going to be having the same conversation every time. Yeah. Just, you know, not really moving things along. So we have one, we have time for one more question. I want to leave that for Wanda. Wanda Williams, do, are, you, are you on with us? Uh, muted. You're muted, Wanda. She must Turn your muted. volume up. We can't hear you, Wanda. We can't hear you, sweetie. Oh, man. I don't know why. Um, we can't hear. Herself. I can't unmute her if she, I don't know. Something's wrong with your audio. Hello? Wanda. Yeah, she, yeah. Wanda? Did you hear her a minute ago? She said, I can hear you, yeah, but her, we can't hear you. Her um, microphone looks unmuted, um, but I can't, but I don't hear her. Can you type your message into the box and we'll read it? Can you type your question? I don't know. I don't know. Type the question. Type the question. She says she can't. Um. Okay. Can you type the question? Okay. Uh, okay. Any <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. Wanda, call, call Nadina. <laughs> yeah. Give me a call. <laughs> uh, anybody else have anything they want to ask really quickly? Uh, there's another one. Either cold air or coldness affects them. I ask because every time I Can't hear you. Uh, how does cold air or coldness how does we can't hear you either yeah so so i got you right here robert uh, how does cold air and coldness affect sickle cell i ask because every time i get cold breeze on my chest for example i can feel a crisis or a pain cranking up well i think that's what i tried to show early on since we do that real fast maybe she came in late but it's important to know that it's not a death sentence We've only, in this country, we've only had, must have been a faster way to do this. These are where the cases are. None in this area so far, but I'm sure there will be. Um, it's been a whole, total of 123 cases. And the symptoms they have, uh, in most cases, 57, 58% have been mild. 12 deaths is about a mortality rate, about 10%. But most people resolve. We do think, we do worry that it's going to affect the lungs and the lungs are so sensitive that once anything that goes on with that, then you're going to develop acute chest before it. And we do know that it causes more clotting. So if someone comes in with COVID and sickle cell, we're going to exchange them right away, do an exchange transfusion, really can take care of their lungs and put them on some prophylactic uh, treatment to kind of keep the clots down. And we think with that, we probably should really be able to reduce. Hi, Dr. Oh, hey there. The long term. Um, 
So you are Aristo, huh? That's yes. your, your your username there. <laughs> and so um, and hopefully reduce things. But you were most people are you know it's probably just a little more worse than the average person, but at least it's not horrifically worse. Um, again, 58% of people are nearly asymptomatic or very mild. And right now with the data we have, 72% of people just get better. Um, small percentage do get really sick. We worry about the lungs and the blood clotting. There's okay. some, there's Robert, some I'm gonna stop you only okay. because I think that maybe you misunderstood that question. Oh. She was talking about cold and the effects of cold, not COVID. I think you thought she oh. was talking about COVID. The question is, how does cold or coolness affect sickle cell? Because every time she gets a cold breeze across her chest, she has a pain crisis. Yeah. Yep. Well, think about what happens when, when you get cold. What happens to your blood vessels? I think they... They, they, they shrink. They shrink. And they then you're going to, it's a setup to start some sickling going there. People are different sensitivity to it. Probably about 80% of my friends here are um, sensitive to cold weather. I wake up in the morning and it's cold and I know I'm getting calls from certain people. Um, and But 20% not so much. They've done a couple of interesting studies with weather and sickle cell. And even more than cold, it's wind that seems to be a driver of causing um, uh, crisis and probably because it cools the skin faster. It's the same same mechanism that you know if, if it's really blowing. You're, it's going to cool the skin. You're going to have more vasoconstriction, causing more um, setup for sickling. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that about does it. We're at 158. Um, anybody got anything short they want? Anybody got any questions they want? Because we got two minutes and then we're out. Is there any update on um, the girl or the woman in Mississippi that was supposed to have been cured from sickle cell using a new therapy? I didn't talk yet about, and I left this again another whole talk, so-called curative therapies. I don't like that term because I'm not sure they're cured yet. Mm -hmm. um, huh, I wonder what that was. Uh, but yeah, there. <clears throat> a whole other area they're looking at is they're trying to both do genetic modifications of people's stem cells. Uh, and you're going to hear the good reports now, but for every good report, there's a lot of people that hasn't been that successful for. And now there's been at least two reports of those therapies causing um, leukemia in patients um, mm -hmm. when they kind of manipulate the wrong thing, which is kind of standard for any sort of bone marrow transplant issues between the drugs they use and the manipulation. So it is an exciting area, but it definitely isn't something that's so close to being, aha, let's you know, start doing it. The reason it's exciting is the idea that if you can take your own bone marrow and just kind of fix it up enough that you can really reduce your symptoms, then you're kind of your own donor. So you're, you're just, the donation's really safe. But the medicines they need to use to get it there and actually the manipulation of the DNA, it's still kind of elementary about how they're understanding what's going on. So I am hoping within five years or so, they actually have a lot more idea about what, how this is working. But it definitely hasn't been something that every time they've tried it, it's been a great success. Um, so that's, I hope that answers your question. Um, but yeah, it's exciting that they have these things, but it's not, It's not guaranteed. To, it's, it, it hasn't been um, regularly successful, let me put it that way. But that's why they're doing studies. They're learning how to, to, work, to work it. Thank you. OK. All righty. Well, thank everyone. Let me thank you all so much for your time, because yeah. it's really been um, appreciated and an informative session. Uh, I want to definitely thank Dr. Ward for all of his information. And as I stated earlier, you all will receive the uh, slides and uh, recording of this session. Our next session will be June 11th, and we'll be sending out information on that. I don't have the name of who's uh, the presenter on that, but uh, I'm sure he's just going to be as exciting and as electric as Robert was. So.
I want to thank you, Robert. <laughs> and see, look how fast uh, three hours went. It you know? really did. Yeah. It, it flew. And thank you, everyone, uh, for spending your want, Saturday with us. There you go. And I want to thank Kimball Torres. And I want to thank for, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I want to thank Jason for those moments to arrive and all those nice exercises. And he yeah. will be doing that throughout the session. And uh, I was just informed that the June 11th session, Kimball Torres will be the presenter. Okay. So if, uh, if you want information prior to the uh, session, send me an email and I do have a syllabus that I can send you. You know, and Tuan has mentioned those binders in, in person. And now we don't, we don't want to just necessarily dispense with that. If you all are interested in that, ask to me, I have no problem sending the information and the binder to you. Okay? And okay. I want to thank Dr. Love for his input and all of all of you that were on there that asked questions. And uh, don't forget to read our newsletter. We've got new things and exciting stuff we're coming out with. And please check out the website because it's so bright and so vibrant and just energetic. I'm sure you all are just going to love it. And if you don't, don't tell me about it. <laughs> I got my first copy of the newsletter. That was great. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ward, and I must apologize. I put you in the database, sir. So you'll be. You should be seeing okay. them on the regular. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, Dr. Hager. Bye, bye. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay, bye, bye. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hager, for addressing so many questions for participants, and as well as about the knowledge in primary adult care preparation for sickle cell patients. Hi guys, I'm Lawrence Fung, and once again, thank you guys for tuning in and participating in our advocacy and empowerment training course this month. As you know, we are living in an extraordinary time, and this is especially scary for sickle cell patients. So here are some COVID-19 precautions to take note of. Follow current social distancing guidelines, wear a mask outside, and go to the ER if you are having breathing issues, possible brain circulation issues, or severe pain that cannot be handled alone. And thank you to our first responders and essential care providers, because without them, many more lives will be in jeopardy. I really hope that the number of corona cases will come down in the future so we can go back to work and work on our inherent issues in our community. If you want to rewatch anything, you can always tune in in our channel right here on YouTube. Just type in Sickle Cell Anemia Awareness SF or the acronym SCAASF in the subject box and our videos would appear. Also, please subscribe to our channel to get updates on upcoming new content. Reminder to all of you that these training courses, which are currently being offered through video conferences, are every month throughout 2020 and are three hours on a Saturday. The last hour of the segment involves a Q&A session where you can ask questions to our speakers. Also, check out our website at scaasf.org for information regarding our organization and how you can join the cause, make an impact, change of perception, and also save a life. Once again, thank you and help SCAA make it happen in 2020 and change the perception.